Let's get the show started. Welcome to MicroConf Remote, the must-see TV experience of the year. For the next five hours, we're gonna take you on a binge-worthy journey that will showcase a story arc that every bootstrap founder aspires to create. MicroConf has been the meeting place for thousands of founders over the last decade. For years, we've talked about hosting MicroConf Remote, but if there was ever a year to take the show online, 2020 is it. When we launched MicroConf back in 2011, terms like stair-stepping, value metric, and the long, slow SaaS ramp of death didn't even exist. And the idea of building a bootstrap startup to a transformational level of success seemed out of the question. For years, this movement has blown expectations out of the water and has created an entire economy of SaaS products with the sole goal of helping others reach scalable, sustainable levels of success. We've had conversations with thousands of founders who have started life-changing businesses to generate thousands, tens of thousands, or more in revenue each month. We've seen folks take back their sense of freedom by having the chance to work for themselves on their own time. We've seen groundbreaking products that have changed the way we work, all while avoiding the rat race of chasing after venture capital. And we believe that you can do the same. That's why we're here today, to show you that no matter the stage of your founder journey, you have all of the resources you need to build something that can change your life. You're gonna hear from an all-star lineup who have reached some of the most celebrated milestones in a business's growth. From launch to the grind towards your first 10K of MRR, then onto a pair of co-founders who have found a clear strategic path to help them blow past 100K of MRR. And finally, we'll leave you with one of the most successful stories of a tech company that has endured the dot-com bubble economic downturns, and was able to launch another business in the midst of a pandemic to viral levels of success. Hi, my name is Patrick. I'm based in the Dallas, Texas area, and I am in the midst of starting my very first productized service business in the healthcare space. Never been to a microconf before, but uh, found this community tangentially through some other podcasts and have really been inspired. Nearly 500 of you are brand new to the MicroConf community. We want to welcome you. These are your people. And we know because they're our people too. Hi folks, my name is Anna Mast and I'm the CTO of Boondockers Welcome, which is an online driveway surfing community for RVers. I went to my first MicroConf last spring as a lucky scholarship recipient. And I was feeling a bit stuck in my business and I had a decent offer to sell on the table. So I arrived thinking I would learn how to run a real internet business and plan to start fresh. The very first night at the Mixer, I had a conversation with a fellow attendee who suggested I read Before the Exit by Dan Andrew of Tropical MBA fame. That piece of advice alone was worth the, the cost of my flight. Through all the hallway track conversations I had, I came to realize that the business I had was a real business, and I started breaking free of some of my imposter syndrome. For those of you returning to MicroConf, thank you. You're the reason we've been grinding away at this event for nearly a decade, and why, when we couldn't come together in April, we knew we needed to make some magic happen. So grab a snack, cup of coffee, or a glass of wine, and welcome to the MicroConf Remote Studio. Uh, it's time to start the founder journey of getting to your first sale. So Corinne Pope is a longtime MicroConf attendee. I've had many conversations with her, and I'm stoked that she's here to share the stage with me today. She's the founder of Speckled, a tool that helps product managers build the right thing at the right time. After stair-stepping her way from a corporate gig to an info product business and then to a product apprenticeship, she recently made the leap into building SaaS products. And in the quest for product market fit, she enjoys talking to customers, designing and developing new features, and of course, fussing over conversion rates as we all do. Hailing from Austin, Texas, she fuels her enjoyment of running stupid long distances, her words, not mine, with Tex-Mex and Topo Chicos. So Corinne Pope, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me on MicroConf. Thanks, Rob. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you about the story of how I inadvertently launched Speckled. Now, from my story, I hope that you can learn from some of my mistakes and take away some new tactics to apply to your own ideas. I'll start with the origin of the idea and how it got off to an admittedly slow start. Talk about the groundwork that was laid 
way before this ever became a thing. And finally, move into how I managed to build up the momentum that I needed to launch my product. So let's get into it. How many of you have had this happen to you? You get an idea, you're super excited about it, so you run to your journal or your note-taking app, you write it down. The more you start thinking about it, the more convinced you are that this is the one, like this is the idea that you need to work on right now. So you spend probably a little bit too much time picking out just the perfect domain, and then you dig into the fun parts. Now this happens to me <laughs> a bit more frequently than I'd like to admit, but you know, the beginnings part is just so much fun. However, fast forward a couple of months, sometimes even a few weeks, <laughs> and something happens. Somehow you've lost a bit of momentum and your great idea has migrated over to your project graveyard. Now, my project graveyard is a pretty expansive place. The amount of money I spend on domain renewal fees is straight up embarrassing. <laughs> but you know, this isn't a place where we really want our projects to land. We want to launch them, put them out into the world, get people on board, and make a tool that provides value to the people that we serve, right? Now, quite honestly, this whole cycle is how Speckled got started off. It was a Sunday in June, in the middle of a hot Texas summer. I was sitting outside, writing in my journal, brainstorming some ideas. I had a job at the time, and we were getting all of this work piled onto our plate, but no new resources to handle it. So we had to prioritize pretty ruthlessly. So I was like, okay, I have this issue, and I get the feeling that other people may too. So I'm going to register a domain and get to work. So I designed the website, write the copy, start drawing up some user flows and wireframes. But then life gets in the way. Now, as I mentioned, I was working a job. My team members were everywhere from Eastern Europe to the US to the Philippines. And it, it felt like I was in meetings from sunup to sundown on some days. And to be honest, at this point, my job was the top priority. And you know, the time needed to get this idea really, really kicked off just wasn't quite there. But still, you know, this idea kept bugging me. It, Elizabeth Gilbert has this concept in her book, Big Magic, that ideas are going to constantly come visit you. They're gonna wake you up in the middle of the night, distract you, and not leave you alone until they have your fullest attention. And then in a quiet moment, they're going to ask, do you wanna work with me? And at this point you can say, no, you know, that's okay. Maybe you're not the right idea for me. You know, why don't you go and meander over to my project graveyard? Or you can say yes. And so this idea had been really bugging me and for so long I wanted to work on it. So I said, yes. At the end of 2019, I had made the decision to leave my job. Quite honestly, I was a bit burnt out at the time. I needed some time to recover and get all those creative juices back. So I took some time to relax, hang out with my family over the holidays, follow some curiosities, and then once I was ready, start working on this idea. And about seven, later, seven months later, I inadvertently launched my product. And today I want to talk to you about the time between committing to the idea and actually launching. Like, what was the difference between this project that landed up launching and all the other ones that had landed in my side project graveyard? Now, in prep for this talk, I did a lot of looking back to try to figure out what it was that made this one different. And I realized it came back to this concept of momentum. Now, previously, I do the whole get super excited about something, lose momentum kind of thing. But this idea, it managed to achieve a sort of escape velocity and avoid the graveyard. And there were two things I realized that helped me achieve this escape velocity. And that was to have a strong base from which to launch, 
And the other one was the tactics that I implemented to get enough momentum to get this thing out into the world. So let's first talk about building your base. Now, to get this started, you're going to need a strong launch pad that you can push off of. And the great thing about this part is it's something that you can work on way before you ever start building a single thing. And for me, the first part of this base is made out of confidence and skills. And, and this component took a good 10 years for me to build. And, you know, I'll just put it out there. I'm not the most confident person in the world. You know, many days on this journey, I've woken up and been like, oh my God, like, what did I get myself into? Can I really do this? And, you know, other days it's like, okay, this is great. I can't believe I get to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. This is awesome. <laughs> so, you know, while I'm not 100% confident, I am about 80% of the way there. And I realized before starting that this, that if, if, if I could get to 80% confident and build the skills that I knew that I would need, I could manage to pick up the rest along the way. So I started working on more and more ambitious projects. Now Rob calls this the stair step approach, and it's an approach that took that I took that worked for me. All right. So I started off in a corporate gig. I was doing project management for government IT infrastructure projects. <laughs> and let me tell you, it was a complete snooze fest. I could only push papers around and follow arbitrary processes for so long before I began to ask, is this really something I want to do the rest of my life? So a couple of years into this role, I decided to start a little info products business on the side. There, I learned the basics of running a little internet business, how to build and distribute a product, and how to make a little bit of money on the web. However, I also learned that you should pick a niche you like, and you should pick a market that is going to be able to support you financially. Now, I did neither. I picked a niche that could not support me, and I quickly began bumping up against the wall. Now, the goal was always to build a product, but I didn't feel like I was quite there yet. I was missing some skills, and I realized that. So I swallowed my pride, and I went and I got a job working for someone else. <laughs> now, I was managing someone else's product, but I was working on developing my product sense, learning how to manage a development team, do onboarding calls, conduct customer interviews, and all other things that come along with running a SaaS product. And after a few years, I was a bit tired. This darn idea was still knocking down my door. I was ready for a change. My confidence was almost there, and I had developed the skills that I need to get started. But confidence and skills aren't the only thing that you need to construct your launch pad. You need a community. Now, I'd always thought of myself as a bit of a lone wolf, like, I don't need anyone. I could do this on my own. It's going to be fine. <laughs> but over time, I started working on finding a community. And now that I have one, I realize just how critical it has been along the way. And there are some really great communities out there. MicroConf Connect is a great example. There's also Indie Hackers, MakerPad, Women Make, I'm in the Go Rails community, and I love that. So go find a community, contribute, and give more than you take. Really dig in and find your tribe. Next up, join a mastermind. They're going to give you the accountability that you need to push through from week to week, and they're going to be the sounding board that you need on this often lonely path. My mastermind group members are on the call supporting me right now. So, hey guys. <laughs> also, consider getting a mentor. Now, if you're gonna go straight up ask someone that has never heard from you, will you be my mentor? You're probably not gonna have a good time. You know, the people you want to be your mentor are often really busy in demand people. So that being said, if you get stuck on something and you want them to weigh in, Maybe type it up in an email, add a little context, shoot it over to them. And if they respond, then that's great. You know, you take their advice and you work on closing that feedback loop. Let them know how their, you know, their advice went and, you know, start building that relationship. And if they don't respond, no worries. Okay. Um, and then. Finally, this is this kind of this kind of thing is something that I wish I had known before I had gotten started. So I just wanted to make sure to include it. 
realize that not everyone is going to understand this path. You know, it's not a role at some famous corporation complete with a matching 401k plan and three weeks vacation. It's a little different. <laughs> some family and friends may not get it at first. And heck, even my parents have no idea what it is that I do on a day to day basis. Now, when Xander called me about speaking to all of you, I was so excited. One of the first things I did when I got off the phone was to call my parents and let let them know. So, you know, they said, hey, hey, mom and dad, like, I'm gonna be speaking at speaking at MicroConf Remote. And they're like, oh, oh, that's nice, Corinne. Congratulations. You know, that'll be a great thing for you to put on your resume for when it's time to get a real job. It's like, ouch. <laughs> But, you know, I think they'll get it maybe eventually, at least I'm secretly hoping that they do. But the funny thing that I realized from this is that you don't need permission to go get started on the path. Like you, you can just go get start, get, go get started. So go start, build your confidence, build your skills, and then get ready for the next phase. Get something out there and start building your momentum. All right, so let's start with the most logical place to start the idea. Now, people say there's no such thing as a bad idea, but I would say that a really good idea can help you get a lot more momentum than say just an okay idea. Now, even though I had this idea for Speckled, I still spent some time making sure it was a good one and making sure it was a valid problem. So I went and I made sure people were talking about this problem online, that people were complaining about it in forums and websites and, you know, all those places online. So, you know, that, that was there. I made sure people understood this category and were buying things like it. I was not quite ready to start a, a whole product in a category that no one understood. So I wanted to make sure that this was a category that existed. And uh, I wanted to make sure that I enjoy being around the kind of people who have this problem. Now, I'm a product manager. I love product people. So I was like, OK, I think I'm good with that one. I can hold my own. And this was kind of the basic criteria that I made sure to suss out and make sure that this was a decent idea. Now, there may be more questions out there you want to consider, but these were the ones that worked for me. OK. So you want to start off with a decent idea, and then it's time to do some dun, dun, dun. marketing. <laughs> yep. If that makes you if that makes you squirm, then I am right there with you. Now I feel like this is an obligatory microconf slide. I feel like it's advice that is commonly dished out and it's commonly ignored, and I think I know why. It's just that building is just so much fun like who doesn't love going into this flow state and doing all the stuff that they love to do and talking about yourself and hyping up your product is super super uncomfortable most introverts like us don't really like to toot our own horn it's awkward and quite honestly it sucks but you know what sucks more <laughs> going into a flow state for a couple of months surfacing for air with something that's ready for the market and realizing you haven't told anyone about it yet. So we're going to try to avoid that. And this is the technique I use to avoid that. And it's um, by building a reverse press release. This is kind of something that Amazon does for their new products. So before anything is ever built, you write a press release, hyping up your new product, talking about its features, the value that users are going to get from it, and heck, maybe even throw some fake customer testimonials in there for good measure. Now, once you've shaped up a product that you'd be happy to see hit the market, then it's time to take some of that language, add it to a landing page, and make sure you add an email capture. <laughs> now, spend a little time promoting that around a bit, and you'll start seeing new emails trickle onto your list. Now then, and only then do you actually go and build the darn thing. Now, as you may have picked up, I am not an engineer by training. I only started teaching myself how to code last year, end of last year, really, and still have a bit of a way to go. Still, though, I was very optimistic on how much I could get done and how quickly I could do it. 
you know, I remember writing in my journal in January, be like, ah, oh, I could totally launch this by March. In March, I wrote, oh yeah, it'll be done by April, maybe. April, it was like, okay, I think I could get it down down by uh, down by May. And you know, things just kept getting getting pushed back. And it was late February. I was on a call with one of my code mentors, and I was walking him through this problem that I was having. And he basically told me that I was making this entirely too complicated for myself. I had all of these tables in my application and a very academic understanding of what a database should look like. So already a couple months in, I was tearing everything apart, starting all over again. And it was a bummer. But from this, I learned to keep it simple. Instead of adding features, cut them. Now, this is what my initial mock-up for my product would look like. Okay, nothing too crazy. But here is what I actually launched with. Just this part in this pink box, just this little prioritization feature. And had I tried to get everything on here done, I probably would have lost any momentum and sent this project to join the many others in my project graveyard. Now, it did feel super underwhelming to launch with this, I'm not gonna lie. But the thing is, I got it out there. And even getting this out there was a bit of a struggle, to be honest. That last 10% of the work was taking the same amount of time as the first 90%. It was like, WTF. I kept hearing myself say, oh, I'll just build this one more thing, this one more feature. I just need to make this one more bug fix. I just need to fix up the UI UX. It needs a little bit of tweaking. It's not quite there yet. Still need to add notifications, so on and so forth. Now, fortunately, I realized that I was killing my mo own momentum. So one day after fixing some issues, uh, I, I realized it was, it was good. It was good enough. You know, it wasn't perfect, but it wasn't, you know, absolutely terrible. So one morning I pushed everything to production. I let that marketing list that I had so conveniently built up a few months ago, know that, you know, Hey, it's live. It's ready to try out. And I watched as some users rolled into my production database. You know, there was no splashy product hunt launch. There was no launch party. Heck, I don't think I even popped open a bottle of wine or cracked open a beer. But you know, what I did have was a product that was in motion. It was out in the world. It's picking up momentum. Users are starting to use it. And now I'm trying to figure out how to build and maintain my momentum. And to be honest, this is a work in progress. From what I've learned so far, you know, feedback has been critical in this part and learning how to take it, how to take it not personally has been a challenge and it's been a really good learning lesson. Now, I'm definitely not good at it by any means. I remember I got my first piece of negative feedback. I was out camping. I checked my phone because I'm apparently the kind of person who brings their phone camping. I know, shame on me. And I saw this piece of negative feedback come in and I was like, oh man, like this sucks. <laughs> so I sit there wallowing my self-pity for about 15, 20 minutes, stare into the campfire and realize that, you know, this feedback is a gift and you can use the feedback that you get after you launch to work on iterating your product and, and building a better product. So you could do a lot of positive with the feedback that you get. And also combined with using your own product, you'll quickly figure out what it is that you need to work on improving. So in review, we talked about building your base and how building a community, your confidence and your skills is going to set you up on the path for success down the road, how a good idea is going to help carry your momentum a bit more than say an okay idea. And of course, then you could go, you know, buy the domain and start thinking about some of the fun parts. But before you do that, spend a couple of days setting up a very basic marketing system so that when you do come up from air for air after building this, you know, you're not starting from a dead stop. You do have some momentum and some, some place to go from here. 
And to be honest, I'm not sure what happens after this part. I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the other speakers uh, that are going to be coming later today to see maybe what's in store for me down the road. But in the meantime, I hope you learned a bit from the story about how I launched Speckled and how it got started off pretty slow, how I managed to build up some momentum with a decent idea, a very simple marketing system, and a pared down product, and how I inadvertently launched to make sure that I could keep my momentum going. Now, if you're thinking about taking this path and launching your own product, hopefully with a bit of a more deliberate launch than I did, I'd highly recommend it. It is incredibly rewarding, and I think you're going to enjoy the ride. You got it. Well, Corinne, again, uh, audience questions are going to start coming in. I'm going to kick us off with a couple questions um, that I had for you. Great talk. I really uh, enjoyed it and loved hearing your story. Um, I think the, the first thing that I wanted to ask is about the stair-step approach that you mentioned. Um, what I've noticed is I personally traveled the stair-step uh, approach, but I didn't realize I was doing it as I was doing it. That wasn't my goal from the start necessarily. I was just so risk averse. I didn't want to build the big SaaS app, quit the day job. I had a you know a wife and a kid and a mortgage and all that. I'm curious with you, did you from the start think I'm going to build the small one and then a next and next and next level up? Or was it more of an inadvertent walk down that path? It was probably a combo of the two. I think that I probably got to the info products business and I was like, okay, like this is cool. Like this is a path that I, I could take in the future. But I'm not. I, I would like to do a product in the future, and I'm not quite there. So I think I'm going to need to take a couple of stair steps. So I kind of got there, halfway there organically, and then the rest of it was a little bit more planned. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a pretty common story, actually. I think some people start doing it because they want to keep the day job, or they don't want to leap from one island to the next. They want to have you know a foot on both of them, and then once they hear about it, it's like a theory that matches up with what they wanted to do anyways. You know, and it kind of gives them permission to do it, I think. Another thing I wanted to touch on is um, about, you talked about asking for permission, um, which is something I've harped on quite a bit because I've, I've spoken at events where it's just tech founders, but I've spoken at events where there were like filmmakers and, and writers. And I've noticed that there's a very similar, um, I don't know, mentality that a lot of us are scared to ship. And, and with writers, I say, or authors, you know, I say, don't ask for permission from a publisher or agent. Go write. Like you look at Andy Weir, who wrote The Martian. He started writing and publishing it on his blog, and it was really good. And people started liking it, and then he eventually published it into a book. He just wrote. Um, filmmakers, you can say, I need money from a studio. You can say, I need permission to get distribution. Or you can do what Kevin Smith or Robert Rodriguez did, and you can go out and just shoot a film for 20 grand, you know, and it's not going to be the best film ever, but it's at least something that you're making and putting into the world. And the same thing with startup founders. I feel like a lot of founders are waiting for permission. I mean, in the Silicon Valley narrative, it's waiting for permission from people to write you a big check to do it. Like, I can't do it without 10 million bucks. And it's like, no, you can. A bunch of people have already done that. Um, but in your case, uh, you know, you really talked about almost asking for permission from, uh, I don't know, it was like from, it wasn't, you weren't waiting for funding, but you were like waiting for, uh, was it permission from yourself? Or, or talk about that a little more about what your particular, you know, predicament was there. Yeah, I mean, I definitely always had a little bit of imposter syndrome and I was like, okay, well, maybe if someone else tells me that I can go and do this, then I can go and do this. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I just like having this, knowing that I have the support of people, but eventually it got to the point where, you know, eventually you just don't care, care as much and you're just like, I'm just going to do it. Screw it. So, um, yeah, so I just... Uh, I just want, I just learned to get over that, uh, that feeling of, um, needing permission to go do it and just do it. And it, it definitely was a little bit of a learned skill. Like, and I remember the first time I told my parents I was even starting like an info products business and they're mm -hmm. like, why don't you just stay with your job and, you know, have that yeah. 401k plan and the benefits yeah. and everything that comes along with it. But you know, that's not what I wanted to do. Right. And that's the part you touched on where family and friends aren't going to understand. I, I ran through the same thing. Um, no one in my family was, or friends were entrepreneurs. And so I got questioned a lot as well as even like, yeah, it, it's always going to be a struggle. Um, I have some questions coming in for you. First question says, I love the press release idea. How do you push it? Meaning how do you promote it? Organic SEO ads? How do you build buzz? How did you build buzz around it? And that's from D. Okay. Um, yeah, actually in terms of the press release, that wasn't something that I, 
actually release into the world. It was more of a thought exercise on how I wanted to shape this product up and get it to the point where it was something that was exciting to people. Uh, so it was um, a good way to me for me to try to figure out some of the messaging that I could then put in my landing page. So I didn't necessarily publish this or promote this anywhere. It was just a document that lived in, you know, in my notion. And, you know, I just would eventually and sometimes go back to it just to make sure that I was on the right path and building the thing that was exciting to build as I was building it. Yep. Yeah, it's something I've actually done myself um, to write to write the, I didn't used to call it a press release, I would call it the landing page. I, so I would start with the landing page before I would build a product or write the book or mm -hmm. launch. Like before we launched the very first microconf, Mike Tabor and I sat down and built a landing page with all the marketing copy and some headshots of people we thought we wanted to be in. And we didn't, we didn't release that before we invited the people, but then that was really the launch. You know, Before we booked a hotel, that's how, that's how we did it. So I like that uh, piece of advice. Um, for our next question, we actually have a brave soul who is going to come on and ask it via video. So producer Xander will bring them on. Hello. My question is, uh, you had people sign up on your landing page because they were curious about the product. How much did you interact or did you interact with those people at all during your building process? I, I did email them a couple of points throughout the process. Um, and another thing that was also helpful was after I sent them to that email capture, I also sent them to a thank you page that had, you know, what brought you here to, you know, why were you interested in this product today? And that helped me get a lot of good information. But yeah, I would email people occasionally on the list, but I probably should have done it more than I did, to be honest. <laughs> but, you know, Hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah, your your first one's always hard. I'll tell you what I so just a quick piece on that. Um, when we launched Drip, which was twenty thirteen now, wow, so long ago. Um, we we started building up a pretty good list, and I had learned enough by then that I knew that we I should be in contact every few months. So I was sending some screenshot updates, but more importantly, I started sending light surveys and saying, "Hey, what's your role?" What are you looking for from Drip? What do you hope it does? You know, all these questions. And then I was able to segment that audience. Um, and then I had some one-on-one -on -one conversations. I, most via email, actually. I didn't do a lot of, of kind of Zoom stuff. Um, but that did help us shape the direction of the product from the start. And so that's a pretty loose framework. I think I went pretty in-depth on Startups for the Rest of Us, which is my podcast I haven't mentioned yet today. But um, there's an episode there where I talk about doing a survey of a pre-launch list. And that really walks through the questions I asked and kind of the um, help it gave me. But it just goes to show you, Corinne didn't do that and still had a, you know, it had a decent launch. So it's like, you don't have to do these things. They just add, they add a little bit. They maybe help you a little bit more with vision or they help you land a few more folks. All right, another question. All right, there's another one uh, where someone's coming on camera. Producer Xander, please roll it. Hey, Corinne, thanks so much for your talk. Really appreciated it. Um, so I, have, I also uh, come from a non-technical background. I'm in sales and business development. Uh, where did you learn coding and which uh, programming language did you start with? Cool. Yeah. So I, in the beginning, I just took a whole bunch of tutorials um, and did all the basic tutorials for a whole bunch of languages. I ended up going through the Ruby on Rails tutorial, and that was the one that made the most sense to me. So that's what I started off with. So started off with going through the tutorials, um, finding some things online. And then I eventually joined the Go Rails community and they have a really great uh, bunch of videos to learn there. So if you're interested in Rails as the language, um, I would definitely recommend them. And uh, yeah, Ruby and Rails just made the most sense to me. So <laughs> that's what I landed up going with. Wasn't super anything super exciting. Wasn't this cool new JavaScript framework du jour. It was just just Rails. I still say that those old proven tools are like the way to go. Um, if I were to build an app today, I would I would go with something very proven. And also, well, I don't know. I'm just the, at this There's point, I'm the old to be guy. said about using boring technology. I know, I know. There's so much of an ecosystem. So we have quite a few questions, and maybe we'll, let's try to lightning round them. I believe we have six minutes left, and we have 12 questions. So let let's see how many we get through. Um, the audience was obviously you know engaged and, and interested in what you're saying. First question, when your first users started trickling in, 
Do you know where they came from? Was it from your email list, social, or something else? Yeah, it was pretty much all from my email list. Uh, I hadn't done too much social promotion, but yeah, it was it was my email list. That was that was the main source. Email list for the win. Yep. I'm a, such a big proponent. I'm glad you touched on that. All right, a question from Arthur Klep Klepchukov. He says, "How else do you keep your scope?" focused and constrained for your first launch. I don't always know when I'm in a rabbit hole. Thanks, Arthur. Yeah, that's that's a tough question. Um, you know, I do try to keep a, a, my list of all the things that I'm working on. I use my own tool for that. I keep everything prioritized. And, I, you know, it's just if I landed up taking way more time than I thought it was going to take, I kind of have to step back and be like, OK, why is this taking so long? Uh, if I get really stuck, I'll um, I'll call up like a, a code mentor and be like, hey, can you help me through this problem? And that'll help me get through it. But yeah, it, you know, it sounds silly, but meditating every morning and having kind of like a, a high level overview of what's going on at the moment and making sure every week um, writing down, you know, what went poorly last week, what was going to happen this week and you know what can I learn from last week and apply to this week so you know making sure that sometimes you know you get into the rabbit hole and you're like doing your work sometimes you just need to remember to zoom out a little bit and you know take a high level overview of what the work that you're doing is yeah I think that's a really nice way to sanity check it um, two other things that I've done, because it's a really hard question. It's, it's, there's no one size fits all. But one thing is when I had a co-founder, that was super helpful. Um, and when I didn't, it was my mastermind group. So there were two or, other three, two or three other folks that I would get together with every couple of weeks. And typically, I would say, man, I'm really struggling with something. And I would email one of them and just set up an impromptu, like, I need to bounce this off the wall. You know, I need to bounce this off someone else for a sanity check. All right. We have a text question from Janet A. Carr. She says, Corinne, could you go into a bit of detail on how and where you distributed your press release and landing page? So again, you didn't distribute the press release, but how did you promote the landing page, I think is, is probably the best way to ask that. So since I was part of the audience that I was selling to, I knew where they were hanging out. There were a bunch of Slack groups online where people were hanging out. So I started getting involved there. And occasionally, you know, if they had a self-promotion channel, I would post it there. Um, there's a whole bunch of Facebook groups, you know, you just need to find the watering holes that your audience is at and go and participate in them. And, uh, and you'll start to, you know, get some involvement from that audience. And, you know, it, it can just pick up from there. So that's, that's what I did personally. Awesome. From David McNeil, how important was it for this project that you were doing it full time, whereas with previous projects, you were also juggling a full time job? Well, to be honest, doing it full time has definitely helped. <laughs> it definitely gives me a lot more focus. And, you know, instead of, you know, approaching it at two hour chunks, I can sit down for a good amount of time and really, really get some of the harder parts and get into that flow state. So I think that having it, doing it full time was definitely beneficial. However, you know, there's something to be said about building something on the side and, you know, spending a little bit of time chipping away at it here and there. I don't, I don't think there's a right answer for, you know, it really depends on what your personality is and what your priorities and what's going on in your life at the moment. Yep, I would agree. All right, our next question is coming to you live from Zachary Kesson. Welcome, Zachary. Producer Xander is going to wire him up. Here we go. Uh-oh. No audio. Yeah, we don't have audio on Zach. If we have the text, in, eh, the question via text, I could read it. Or Producer Xander, you can send me the next one. All right, what is a good way to get people into a mailing list if you have no traffic? Ooh. I think you kind of have to produce some traffic, don't you? Yeah, I think you do have to produce some kind of traffic. So like I mentioned before, getting involved in the places where my community, where the audience was hanging out was a good source of traffic for me. It was probably the best source of traffic that I had. Um, so go and get involved in your your audiences, communities, and, you know, 
you know, give more than you take in those communities, you, you know, answer questions. You don't have to be the one always promoting what it is that you're working on. Make sure that you're providing value to the people there. And, you know, then maybe organically they'll check out your little, you know, profile link and be like, okay, what is this person looking at? So. All right. 26 seconds left, Corinne. Last question from George I. Nikolev. He says, did you find your product market fit first or did you have the audience first and you built the product they needed? I think I went with the audience first approach. Like I, I knew that I really wanted to serve project product managers. I knew that our lives were pretty chaotic at times and that they could use all the help that, that we could get. So I, I definitely concentrated on product managers first, figured out what problems that they were having that I was also having and, you know, went from there. So I definitely went audience first for my project. Corinne Pope, thank you so much again for joining me on MicroConf Remote today. It was great to be here. It began as an idea. Eager to escape his unnecessarily complicated dealings with domain hosting, Anthony Eden, a mild-mannered web dev with a penchant for surfing, thought, this should be simple. And DN Simple was born. I want to make domain name management super simple for everyone to use. Sounds impossible. I'm in. There would be no venture capital or giant corporations pulling the strings. Just a tightly knit remote team of normal folks building the most streamlined domain name management automation the internet, no, the world, has ever seen. 10 years, 16,000 amazing customers, and 400,000 domains later begs the question, what's next? The team worked tirelessly, day and night, searching for an answer to this baffling conundrum. Among the proposals, a magical domain connecting button. Congratulations, you're connected! Voice controls, connect my domain. I'm sorry, did you say croquet championship? They even thought of enlisting a soothsayer to connect domains before they were even thought of. I can see the future. But as the team toiled on, one idea soared above the rest. People should be able to connect domains to the services they use without even thinking once about DNS. Sounds impossible. We're, We're in. in. Journey with us through the next 10 years of DN Simple. Anthony is the founder of DN Simple and a huge supporter of the MicroConf community for years. And with a decade of success under his belt, he's got some exciting new things coming up. So we're excited to share a few screen minutes with him to chat about what's happening over the next 10 years. Mr. Eden, welcome to MicroConf Remote. Hey, thanks. Hopefully you can hear me. Been having a heck of problems with audio today. <laughs> Absolutely. Nope. I can hear you loud and clear. My first Excellent. question is, is for you, is surfing longboard or short? Shortboard, for sure. Indeed. A better, better man than I. I was a longboarder <laughs> and not that good at it. So I want to <laughs> ask you a, a couple questions over the next couple minutes. Um, you, you bootstrapped DN Simple a decade ago. Now you're at about 15 employees. What made you think 10 years ago, I guess I'll start with the pain. What pain were you solving when you started DN Simple? It's a pretty ambitious idea. Yeah, so the, the domain industry at the time was pretty stagnant and I was using one of the big players and I just got fed up with using their, I was like, I know how all of this works. I've been working in the domain industry for years. How is it possible that I am using this terrible interface? There's no API, this is just awful. And I think that was the initial start of it. I just said, I got to be able to do something that's better than this, that's designed for developers and for entrepreneurs rather than for, uh, for somebody who it doesn't need that type of experience. So yeah, that's how it started. And I mean, you went into a very crowded space, obviously competing against hundreds and hundreds of other domain registrars, including big, big gorillas, you know, like GoDaddy or Namecheap or, or these others. What kind of, what made you think that you could pull that off? I think a lot of it just came down to knowing that there was still a gap there. There was there was definitely an underserved market of, of developers like me who were looking for something with a, a better experience, um, and and they weren't getting that from these other providers. And those other providers really had no incentive to move forward in any way. The the the, the battle had been to the bottom for prices, and and so I I wanted to give it a chance, and and I took my experience and started trying to work on something really that that I thought people would want to use. And plus, we gave good support at the same time. And there were a lot of problems at the time with how do you get somebody who's intelligent, who knows how domains work? And again, this comes from just, I was in the business for a long time before giving it a, a try as starting a business. And it felt like the right time, even, even with all the big players who were there now and or were there before and even more who have come in now. 
Yeah, that's the thing. I think a lot of founders are scared away by these big markets, these competitive spaces. But if you can find a massive space, there's always all, all, uh, almost always room to niche yourself in, especially if you're part of that market. You've done it with DN Simple. I did it with Drip. You know, it was a, it was a nightmare trying to launch an ESP, but it, you do it and you find that angle. But you just, you can't go head to head with them, right? It's like, you, you didn't go and try to be GoDaddy. You tried to be the not GoDaddy, you know, or the not name cheap, or to figure out where the, the gaps were and where the opportunities were. All right, final <laughs> Final question for you today. What is the thing you're most excited about that you guys are launching in the next, you know, whatever, in the next year or two, six to 12 months, uh, whatever? We've been working really hard on trying to make a, an addition, a new API into our system where people can integrate better and push data back into DN Simple. So you can actually, for example, wire up external services and see how they're operating for any given domain. And that's the one I keep pushing to try to get. Uh, to get us to go to, because I feel like that's going to be something that's going to be exceptional is essentially not just querying into our system, but actually pushing back metadata about services and domains in real time, essentially. Yep. Amazing. Thank you so much, sir, for all your support of MicroConf and uh, for coming on the show today. It's been great having you. Thanks, Rob. Have a good one. This is a 2017 Volvo XC90. The XC90 is a mid-size luxury SUV manufactured and marketed by Volvo Cars since 2002, and now in its second generation. Both generations of the XC90 have won Motor Trend's SUV of the Year award in their debuts. This particular vehicle is rarely washed and comes fully loaded with cups, books, papers, and other items long since abandoned by my children. The XC90 has three rows of seats, perfect for carrying a lot of gear, a lot of kids, or both. The tachometer goes to 8,000 RPM, and the in-dash computer never fails to play the best grunge tunes of the 90s. Welcome to our remote edition of MicroConf Remote. We're not live on set, but we're actually driving around. It's startup founders in cars getting coffee. We're truly remote. Am I going to get coffee out of this? No, it was just an expression. We, <laughs> sorry. That was like such false advertising. <laughs> I thought you were actually just inviting me for coffee. So I rented this Maserati here. So this is could, your Volvo. So we could drive around uh, Paris. Yeah, no, this is great. Thanks so much for, for joining me for a few minutes to chat about founder origin stories. Can I get like a rain check on the coffee? Rain check on the coffee, rain check on driving around Paris. <laughs> In a Maserati? <laughs> you made big promises. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> and the so entire microcom community now has my back on this. I hope, can we edit, editor, can we cut that part out? <laughs> so this is my lovely wife, Dr. Sherry Walling, and she is the founder of Zen Founder. She's host of the Zen Founder podcast. And she and I co-founded our family and co-wrote a book called The Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Shit Together. And what we're going to talk about today is actually a piece about founder origin stories that made it into, it really is the second chapter of the book, understanding where you come from to optimize where you're going. And I think to set the stage, um, you know, as a clinical psychologist, someone who, who works with founders, high-performing executives, CEOs, how does someone's story or their origin impact how they operate day to day and how they run companies? And, and I think the real question is like, why should a founder listening to this care about how they were brought up, about how they were raised, about their family system? Yeah, I have a lot of conversations about this, actually. And I think because most of us who are entrepreneurs are so... Um, either future oriented or very present oriented. We kind of live in the moment, we're planning for the future, we're building something, working towards something. It can be easy for us to overlook the importance of reflecting back on our past. But um, a lot of the science that's coming out really in the last 10 or 15 years really speaks to the importance of understanding how your early life narrative might shape things as simple as your relationships, your capacity for trust, or even the way that your body responds to stress. Um, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study is, was a really, really large sales scale study conducted in the U.S. that looked at like health data for something like 17,000 people and found really, really strong relationships between early life adversity and things like depression, suicidality, things that you would expect, but also things like heart disease, um, number of times of types of cancer, diabetes, obesity, things like that. So I guess um, maybe a long-winded way of saying it is that your past matters a tremendous amount to your relationship to your body and to the way that you solve problems, the way that you manage stress, the way that you really respond to the life that you're living right now. 
Yeah, and I think that holds, certainly holds true for me. I know that the way I was brought up and the way that I was taught to deal with conflict or adversity or manage anger or all that is, or anxiety is something that I have to manage on a day-to-day -day basis, right, as a founder. Yeah, and it's even, it's even more um, maybe nuanced than what you were taught or what you observed. It's really what got encoded into your body and the way that your DNA responded to the kinds of environment that you were exposed to as a kiddo. Right. And so as part of, of Zen, the Zen Founder podcast, which is what on episode, is it 250 or something at it's this point? More, like, yeah, more than that. 254, 255, yeah. something like that. You know, you did a series of interviews for that where you talked to a, actually multiple rounds of interviews over the course of a couple of years. It was you, kind of my summer project. Yeah. So over the course of the year, we would put out new episodes during the year and then over the summer I would sort of do a bunch of interviews at once and then have them ready to release throughout the summer that they were all founder origin stories so I did a really deep dive into lots of microcomp speakers actually Sally FD, Patrick McKenzie, Jason Cohen, um, lots of folks that we know well in the community and um Eaton Shaw, Ruben Gomez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they became really interesting conversations to just say, hey, tell me how you grew up. Like, what were your first experiences of entrepreneurship? What shaped you and what made it hard for you to get to where you are now? Yeah, and, and as part of that, you pulled out four patterns or four kind of commonalities that a lot of the founders shared, these ambitious, um, high-achieving founders who had achieved success. And I'd love to run through those now. And in addition, I think one of the, perhaps even the more interesting part is you then pulled out these four archetypes, these founder archetypes, um, or would you call them founder archetypes? Sure. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, they're pretty cool. Like the, to tease them, it's like the golden child, the loner, the pleaser, the survivor. And so I'd, I'd love to dig, dig into those in, in just a second, because you have some kind of risks or like pros and cons and how to, if you find, if you find that you resonate with this, like this is probably how you operate and, and ways to kind of optimize, you know, who you are and how to, how to get the most out of things, right? Yeah, I think one of the things that I really wanted to drive home in the course of doing these interviews, and I didn't have to make the point, the interviews made the point themselves, is there are lots of ways to become an entrepreneur. It's not like you have to have a certain kind of background or a certain type of life experience that makes you successful or not successful. And so by, by looking at the interviews um, kind of thematically and pulling out different archetypes, it, I think it really helped me to see how people can be successful and then also have, you know, have shadow sides or have risk factors, have downsides to really whatever kind of upbringing they experienced. Cool. So what were the, before we get into the archetypes, what were those four um, patterns or commonalities that you found across a lot of the successful founders that you interviewed for this founder origin series? Yeah, I found that um, of the folks that I interviewed, almost all of them had some kind of early life adversity. Um the death of a parent, a big transition, a big move, maybe right when they're going into junior high, some really big shift, a parent with cancer, um, the loss of a sibling, you know, mental illness, a parent yeah. with mental illness, a parent with substance abuse. So these are the things that might show up in that adverse childhood experiences study that I mentioned <clears throat> earlier, things that really disrupt the trajectory of your childhood. But in the case of these founders, the key thing that we know really from the field of psychological research, which really bore out in my conversations with entrepreneurs is that that high adversity was accompanied by a high level of support. So there was someone in that kid's life who maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a parent, an uncle, an aunt, um, someone who saw something and just encouraged and supported and helped make kind of a safe place for that young person to continue to develop. So high adversity you know, we tend to be okay. We can tend to be resilient if we have a helpful supportive adult around. So that's what I found in a lot of the interviews was that trend. Um, so high, high adversity, but high support. Right. That combination yeah. had to exist together. And I, I definitely found totally true to the entrepreneurial story is that people just had an inherent need to blaze a trail. Like these were kids who these founders were children who weren't necessarily super content to just roll with the rules mm -hmm. as they were presented to them. They were people who were either trying to break the rules in sometimes like a pretty problematic way. Um, you know, Dan Martell tells some stories about breaking rules that got him in big trouble. Um, but they were just people who weren't super content with the status quo and wanted to, you know, go off trail a little bit. Yep. And that pattern persisted even when, or really began when they were young children. The third is that these were folks who were self-taught and self-led. Like, 
um, Patrick McKenzie. I love the story about him. He um, really was interested in coding. He loved video games. He wanted to write video games and make video games, but he didn't have a computer. So um, he went to the library and checked out library books about coding and started writing out code by hand. Hmm. So he learned to code from books and then would just do the mental exercise mm -hmm. of coding. Of compiling it. Of writing it yeah. by longhand, right? Yeah. So that's that's a unique trait, and that's kind of the entrepreneurial secret sauce is somebody who can get themselves going, is self-motivated, and is going to teach themselves. Yeah. I, I actually did that as well, although I had a computer, but when my brother was coding, I would write it out on binder paper. I know, it's like... You're it's, like, when's my turn? When's totally, my turn? It's like time sharing, you know, but when I didn't know what that meant. So that was a third. What's the fourth? The last one in this one, oh man, was so important for me to reflect on as a parent. Yeah. Um, the last one is time. All of the entrepreneurs that I talked to, or the vast majority of them, had extended periods of time to tinker. Um, so one, my favorite example of this is Heathman Shaw. Um, his dad would take him, his dad was a physician, he'd take him to the hospital in the evenings when he was doing paperwork or whatever, and he'd basically hand him a screwdriver and let him loose in the, in the like, IT room, like with yeah. all of the machines and just be like, hey, entertain yourself essentially. So he then had all of this time to just, I mean, frankly, like probably take apart computers and look at circuits and just problem solve. And, and I think the thing that, um, you know, is so dangerous for us, maybe in our era of parenting is that a lot of kids that I know are really, really structured, their days are really full yep. and they don't have this expansive time to just kind of mess around in the basement and tinker and write code by hand or, or listen to their own imaginations. So I thought that was a really important take home about that, that road to entrepreneurship involves time to just sort of mess around and tinker. The first is the golden child. Second is the loner. And then there's the pleaser and the survivor. You want to maybe talk through the, the golden child being mindful of time as our time is, is running short, but talk through that. And like, I don't know what you have advantages, disadvantages, things to watch out for, whatever it is you want to add context to just what the, you know, what the golden child kind of archetype is. Yeah. So the archetypes take a little bit more time to explain, but I'll do my best. Um, so as you're hearing this, realize you're hearing this very sort of redacted version of this. So forgive me if it feels overgeneralized. There's a full book chapter too. It's like $4 on Kindle. The Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Shit Together. Chapter two is basically the expanded version of this. If, if you want to dig in deeper. So, um, in the course of these interviews, I realize that a lot of people come to entrepreneurship and in different ways. So one way is, is this sort of golden child upbringing experience. And this is like probably what all of us strive to provide our kids as parents. Lots of support, lots of stability, lots of um, capacity to go deep in your own interests. Like these are the parents that are out on the soccer field, like just cheering you on, bringing the snacks, like all invested in you. And I think um, this, again, highly supportive, very enthusiastic, lots of resources. And this is great for people in the entrepreneurial journey because they really, I think, develop this deep sense of confidence, this deep sense that uh, what they think, how they see the world, that that matters and that it's something that's worth sharing or that people will generally be responsive to when they share it. So that's one of the best, um, you know, aspects if you're going into this sort of life of entrepreneurship, which can be pretty hard, is that, you know, you have this great foundation of support and belief in yourself. Um, the downside of this is that sometimes people just have very limited experience with failure. I mean, you think of the, the it kid, the student council president or the high school quarterback or the head of the cheerleading squad. These are these are kids who really have a lot of support, maybe a lot of coddling even, and they just haven't had to fight super hard, which can be a downside when you're an entrepreneur and you you know you have you have things that don't work well that you have to sort through right and how about the second that is the loner yeah the loner is you know is maybe the kid who's in the library handwriting code <laughs> this is someone whose way of seeing the world or their interests didn't necessarily align with a, an obvious peer group, maybe when they're teenagers. And so much of the development of who they became and what they cared about happened within their own, you know, their own autonomous time. Okay, there's someone in the middle of the road taking a picture of a bald eagle in a tree. So that's that's Minnesota that's moment thing. for you right now. <laughs> See if the camera catches it. There is a bald eagle in this there's tree. A, yeah. Okay, so the loner, I mean, in some ways this is a great advantage because 
you're used to hearing your own voice. You're used to cultivating your own ideas. You spend a lot of time in your own head in a way that I think can really yield a lot of ingenuity. And again, a sense of confidence and a way of just knowing yourself well and trusting your own creative process. But of course, this is a downside because as much as we like to think that we can be successful in a vacuum, networking and our relationships and our connections are incredibly important no matter what we're doing as entrepreneurs. So the downside potentially of the loner is that those early life skills in terms of how to really connect with other people, um, how to really build a network and a, a sort of a bunch of different relationships may not be as intact or as well practiced as could be helpful. And this is the one that resonates the most with me, with my upbringing, because we lived out in the middle of nowhere. We had books and computers and with no internet because it was in the 80s when I was growing up. And um, I thought that my whole deal when I first started doing software, right, doing products was like, I'm going to do it all, all on my own. I don't have to answer to anyone. It was micro, solo. It was all about being a solo all founder. Myself. No yeah. network. I didn't build that. And then eventually I realized, oh, I was just never taught that skill. And I, I have, I've learned that over the past 15 years, but it was, yeah. a, it was a detriment to me at the start. How about the third? Yeah, the third, um, I call the pleaser. And this is... Um, this is the kiddo who's growing up in a context where maybe they have a pretty hard driving parent, a parent that wants them, you know, to be that high school star athlete, but they're really more of a, a chess playing kind of kid. This is where, you know, you think of like the person who's kind of trying to overcompensate for that parent who pushed them really hard, who maybe they felt like they were just never successful enough. And I think this is in some ways, it's a tough upbringing, but in some ways it, it really helps you develop these skills of learning to read what people need. Like this is a great customer skill, right? You're learning what your customers need and how to respond in ways that um, really fit their needs. This is the kind of entrepreneur who will over deliver, who is somebody who really um, kind of understands the emotional context of what people will pay for and what they want and what they need. Um, but this is ne not necessarily someone who is able to set good boundaries for themselves, for their family, or for their business. This might be the person who's always like, yes, 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 but that drives themselves into the ground because they're not actually thinking about what's most important for them or for the growth and well-being of their business. They're other-oriented mm -hmm. in a way that's both helpful and problematic. The survivor is the last archetype that I came across, and this is the kiddo who really dealt with a lot of um, maybe aggression, violence, instability, chaos in their early life experience. And this is somebody who has potentially lots of street smarts, who really knows how to get what they need and provide for themselves, even in really, really sort of difficult situations. Um, so great entrepreneurial skill. And like, this is the person who doesn't get up, give up rather. This is, they don't give up. They're a fighter. They're a strong, strong sort of mental game. Um, but this can be problematic in the sense that um, this kind of upbringing tends to either lead to a path where people are pretty shut down emotionally, like they're just kind of machines or they're pretty reactive emotionally. They may um, experience a lot of anger or not necessarily have had calming experiences that help their body regulate well when they're under a lot of stress or distress. So again, really hard driving, forceful, powerful, um, but maybe not always know how to wield that power in helpful, positive, productive ways. Uh, the bottom line is that no matter what upbringing you have, um, there are strengths and there are liabilities in that. So it's worth the time to just do a little bit of exploration around what you're coming to this point in your life with. What are the lessons that your upbringing taught you? What are the things that it maybe didn't teach you so well that you might need to supplement? Um, and I give some more, we give some more tips and tricks and strategies Tactics. in the book if you're needing to just fill out your early life experience with some counterbalancing growth. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest pivot points or changing points for me as an entrepreneur are when I started realizing my weaknesses and really honed in on, on my upbringing, but it was both my strengths and my weaknesses and how I handle stress and how I handle certain situations. Um, that was a big point of growth. Again, probably about 15 years ago is when that started, you know, and really culminated maybe five years ago, or I'm sorry, about 10 years ago where I was like, okay. You just finished right. growing at that point? No, but I finished, I, I knew a lot more about myself. Like it was a dramatic, you know, increase. So thank I, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time, but I do think it's helpful to realize that 
this kind of growth process is ongoing. Like you oh, do sure. some of the growth, you do some early childhood stuff, and then there are times when you have to revisit it because your perspective on it changes as you grow, as your kids grow, as different factors around you change. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Walling, for joining us today. Um, you, you owe me a coffee. <laughs> owe you a coffee and a Maserati, it sounds like. She is it's all right. at Zen Founder on Twitter, and you host the Zen Founder podcast if folks want to, uh, to keep up with you. All right. Thanks. Have a great microconf, y'all. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Founders in Cars, Not Getting Coffee. I uh, enjoyed that. If you're interested in the book we kept mentioning, it's called The Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Shit Together. And chapter two of this book is, in essence, an expanded version of the conversation that you just heard. Howdy, I'm Rand Fishkin, co-founder and CEO of Spark Toro, uh, previously the founder of Moz and author of Lost and Founder. And I want to help you folks at MicroConf Remote uh, with one thing that you can do today that can potentially have a transformative impact on your business tomorrow and in the future. So uh, I'll show you something that's been working really well for us here at SparkToro, which is, uh, so we have this, this free tool. Well, we have a free version and then a paid version. It's a, the software is a subscription, like, like probably a lot of you with, at MicroConf. And um, one of the things that we do that works really well is when someone starts running their free search, right? So they say like, oh, well, my audience whatever, uses these words in their profile, uh, software engineer, right? And they, they run that first search. They're asked to um, uh, sign up and put in their email. I'm, I'm logged into my account, but you get the idea. They, they, uh, they uh, have to create an account with us and give us their email and uh, that email address and that registration process means that we can shoot them a quick message. And I send them a message from my email account, right? Rand at SparkToro.com. Like it, it comes from me uh, that says, can I help you with your SparkToro account? And it's just a super short uh, email message. In fact, it, it literally says, um, can, I, can I help with your SparkToro account is the title. This we found works really well, high open rate. Uh, and it says, you know, hi, first name, saw your SparkToro sign up, wanted to offer these suggestions for your free searches. We give people 10 free searches. This is my personal email. So if you have questions or a minute to tell me what you'd like to accomplish with the tool, I'm happy to help. That's Tran Fishkin. So it looks and feels like a real email because it really is. If they send a reply, it comes right to me. I get a dozen, two dozen, sometimes three dozen of these replies uh, every day. It's, it's pretty awesome. It's a fantastic way to connect with the customers and potential customers of our product and people who are using it, get a sense for who's struggling, how, what they're trying to do and accomplish. I love this when, when you're at a small scale, right? When you have um, a few dozen to a few hundred people signing up every month for your product, offering something for free, and then getting in touch with those folks and building those relationships. Just incredibly powerful. If you can find a way to do this in your software business, I think you can really move the needle on getting a deep understanding of who your potential buyers are, and then taking the messaging that works, that, that's helping people uh, at a one-to-one at -one level, and translating that into what you put on pages like you know, your homepage, which we've done with SparkToro, right? This instantly discover what your audience reads, watches, listens to, and follows. That comes from those conversations. The whole how it works page, the the video, uh, the the graphics and explanation, it all comes from these conversations. And I, I find that uh, incredibly helpful. So I encourage you to do it with your software business as well. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Good luck. Um, We're going to dive into our second keynote of the day. And if you recall, our first keynote was from Corinne Pope, and that was on that first stage of getting to launch and having that first sale. The second keynote that we're about to roll into talks about the next milestone that many of you in, uh, in the crowd are trying to achieve. It's 10K MRR. It's the point at where a lot of us can go full time. We're going to hear from Colleen Johnson. She's an enterprise agile coach, a speaker, a trainer, an entrepreneur. She's the co-founder and the CEO of Scatterspoke. Colleen, thank you so much for joining me on MicroConf Remote today. Thanks for having me here, Rob. Excellent. I'll let you take it from here. From here. All right. Thank you. Well, I do want to disagree with you, Rob, and we can settle this in the, in the Q&A, but I do think Mall Rats was probably one of the best movies ever made. So I disagree with the $20,000 budget. 
Okay, well, let's dig in here. So what is Scatterspoke? Scatterspoke is a tool for um, for online retrospectives, and it's, it's built to help agile teams have um, continuous feedback about how they're working so that they can have honest conversations about what things are working and what needs to improve and, and make adjustments to their process along the way. So when we think about um, retrospectives, they typically look something like this. What didn't go well? What, what went well? What didn't go well? What can we improve? They're um, usually done in a room where everybody's together with stickies on the wall and often done on a regular cadence. Um, and not for a lot of teams that are running scrum practices, this is an every two week occurrence or at the end of each sprint, you're reflecting back on the sprint and saying, how did this work? What can we change um, for teams that are running um, Kanban or maybe longer running intervals? Um, they might do this monthly, but it's a chance for the team to all come together and really have an honest conversation with each other. So you might be thinking, that's cool. This is all cool. Why the hell would someone pay for this? Um, which is a, a valid question. Um, you know, I think when, from my experience, and I've been in, in the agile world for 10 years, a little over 10 years in the software industry for over 20, um, it sounds really straightforward. At get everybody together and get everybody talking. But when you think about um, teams, especially teams of software developers, it can be very hard to get great, honest feedback from people. Um, it can be even harder when you think about that interval of time between when something happens and when we get together to talk about it, people forget. Um, we want to sweep those emotions under the rug and not really have a, you know, have an honest conversation about what's going on. Um, so it can be hard to feel like these are having any, you know, any actual impact on how we're working. I think the other piece of this that, that's really important when you think about the tool that we're providing to teams is that you can have the same conversation at every retrospective. It can feel a little bit like Groundhog's Day. I'm probably dating myself with this movie reference too. <laughs> so you can end up having this same exact conversation where you're maybe talking about your you know, issues with your CI CD pipeline, or you're talking about issues with um, with your QA efforts and wanting to move to automation. But if you're doing this every two weeks and you're having the same conversation, it's it's hard to feel like this is a productive use of anyone's time. Um, and what's worse is for a lot of organizations, these these conversations are probably happening in with multiple small teams all at the same time. Everybody's talking about the same similar problems, and we don't have a great way to connect the dots to see how we can improve those, you know, those pain points for the organization. So like Rob said, this story isn't about the tool. It's about the journey and how we got there. Um, you are not mistaken that that first um, image on our timeline here of our road to 10K is a Coors Light can. <laughs> so in um, 2015, my husband and I were hanging out one afternoon, drinking Coors Light in the backyard. And he said, I really want um, to learn more about how to build a real-time app. So I want to learn Node.js and Angular and, and play around with WebSockets. And at the time, I was moving into a consulting position, and I was working with a lot of teams on how to build out a portfolio, um, portfolio Kanban system that would help them track things like um, how to do exploratory testing on um, problems and solutions with users before building things. Um, and I said, you know, this sounds this sounds fun. Let's try to, let's try to build something. Um, and it felt like a great way for him to get his hands dirty with the technology he was interested in and for me to really put my money where my, where my mouth was. I was teaching other teams how to do these things, but had never built something on my own. So it was really started with an opportunity to learn. Um, I knew the Agile space really well. And so I knew that there was this need for um, a way to have a retrospective where people could provide feedback anonymously and not be tied to the comments they were putting up on the stickies. And then the other problem I kept seeing was that um, in, in clients I was working with, they would um, constantly reschedule their, their retrospectives, especially if they were on a Friday and people were out or they were down to the wire on a sprint deadline. It was the first meeting to always get pushed off. So I wanted to figure out how could we um, how could we build something and test out you know these new technologies. How could we build something I could use? So it was very selfish that I could use with my clients to help um, make these retrospectives a better experience for for the teams. 
Um, so sat around, drank a bunch of Coors Light, um, did exactly what Corinne said and hopped on and tried to buy a domain. <laughs> um, and then we did the very important next step of um, purchasing a shitload of stickers and then nothing happened. <laughs> so I got really focused on consulting um, and used, you know, I continued to use the tool from a coaching perspective. My husband, John, continued to tinker with it and play around with different technologies, but we really didn't do a whole lot with the tool for about a year. Um, it was really cool because it was an opportunity for me to keep using it with people and hear real-time feedback. And I would come home with that and say, you know, people want to be able to vote or want to be able to group on items um, or create an action item. And so we were slowly adding new things, but never, still never really had the intent of turning this into an actual business. It was still just something um, that was for both of us, both of us to learn how to, how to put all of this into practice. So the next step for us, um, around 2017 um, was actually, we started to see that using our Google Analytics, that we had a, a fair amount of, of people coming to the site. We, that was all we could track. We didn't have the concept of a user. So we said, why don't we go ahead and create um, a simple way to register before you can access the boards? Still, everything was completely free. There was you know, no charges or credit cards or subscriptions or anything at that point. It was just a way to collect email addresses. Um, and I was the one that was very reluctant to um, have any kind of user registration for the longest time. I wanted to make sure that this was simple to use. I was very scared that if we made it harder to, you know, if we made it harder to get in and, and use the tool quickly, that people would just stop using it. Um, and what we found was quite the opposite. We just saw the, the number of registered users going up and up and up in 2017. Um, we closed 2017 out with about 12,000 users. And um, what was really funny when Corinne was talking about feedback was that year we also installed Drift so that we could look so we could start to communicate with people if they were having issues, if they had feedback. Like Corinne said, um, we had some really rough feedback there for a while. Probably one of the funniest moments I think was like her campfire story. We were sitting around and had somebody pop on and say, um, your UI looks like shit. It looks like it was built by a drunk intern. <laughs> so <laughs> We had some fun moments that, that were a little painful, but um, that combination in 2017 of creating a user account and being able to communicate with users and track users, um, and then also have Drift on the site. So we were getting feedback and understanding what problems they were running into kind of changed everything for us. Um, the funny part about having Drift on there was towards the end of 2017, we had somebody pop on Drift and um, it was kind of uh, creepy at first. They were looking for me specifically and invited me to come speak at um, a big agile conference in Brussels, Belgium in 2018. So we got super excited and we saw this as a way um, to launch a new version of the site that would start to charge. And we used that experience of, of keynoting and being on stage in Brussels as kind of this kicking off point. So that was in February of 2018. So we spent really like the entire holiday season leading up to that, trying to get um, a complete redesign of the site up with new logos, new, just a completely brand new um, interface that we ended up launching um, alongside that Agile conference in Belgium. So we started charging and we kept the free version, but we always, we made it, we made some of the other features basically um, subscription only. And um, when we, when we launched all of this, we were pretty close to 20,000 registered users. And we started to see some small conversions. Um, I think at that time, you know, it was like just as many people that would subscribe would cancel a month later. So we were still missing something. And we were continuing to communicate with people through Drift, get feedback about the tool, um, and really start to understand what things were missing. Um, I would say around the same time in 2018, we saw a ton of other retrospective tools start to enter the market and charge. So it was kind of validating for us that this was this was something that could become an actual business because we were starting to see some competition. Um, we were also pretty excited around you know the competition that was coming into the space. Uh, took a very different approach to retrospectives than what we were doing, and so it gave us kind of a unique a uniqueness in the industry. 
So in 2018, we kind of, we saw a lot of use, uh, usage go up, new accounts coming in, um, started to see some of those convert, but it wasn't like we were going to quit our day jobs anytime soon. It was still a very slow growth. And then um, in 2019, I think we were both starting to feel like um, we were, I think we were both just distracted, to be honest. Um, I was leaving my consulting career and starting my own consulting business. My husband was working for um, a big uh, uh, cryptocurrency exchange. And so we were both kind of getting focused in very different places. And I think feeling a little bit like this just wasn't going to work, especially not on nights and weekends. <laughs> Um, and all of a sudden, we got a request from a huge company that wanted to buy 2,000 licenses. Um, and we were like, oh, my God, what's happening? Where is this coming from? Um, this is never, you know, we didn't really even know how to do enterprise pricing. We were Googling for enterprise contracts. <laughs> we didn't have a lawyer. We didn't have, you know, we just really were not ready to do any of this. But super it like reinvigorated all of our energy around trying to make this into an amazing business. Um, so we went down the path of contract negotiation with this big company um, to get them set up with 2000 licenses. And a big part of that was we just didn't have a lot of um, infrastructure in place to support a large organization yet. So we had to build out like an admin portal to manage teams and accounts. We had to build out single sign on. We had all of these things that this company wanted us to build as part of this contract that was actually in a lot of ways forcing us to an actual product market fit that we just didn't have before. I think it was a it was a cool way for us to learn and experiment um, in both of our areas of expertise. But for uh, up until this point in time, a lot of what we were doing was was playing. Um, I would get ideas and want to try something. John would get ideas and want to try something different. And so. Um, until we had this big enterprise deal staring, staring us down um, with all these custom requests, it really helped us see what do we need uh, to sell into these large organizations going forward. So it was, I, I think we didn't really find our product market fit until just last year. So going into this year, so we are part of the 2020 um, Tiny Seed Cohort. And um, we've had a bunch of, of great things happen this year. So we've been able to focus on, on this business full time now. Um, we have been able to invest in marketing, which we had never spent any money on in the past. We've gone down the road of getting um, a lot of security things shored up that we hadn't done in the past. And we're on track to close two more large enterprise deals this year. We've closed three smaller enterprise deals um, since coming on um, or since the beginning of 2020. So we're on track to hit uh, 10K MRR hopefully next month and expect to close those two enterprise deals before the year is over. And that will pretty much double where we're at in terms of MRR. So we're super excited. This path has been kind of a crazy road for us of um, a lot of ups and downs. And it was interesting to hear Sherry talk because I was thinking about some of that emotional roller coaster that you feel of um, being super excited and having a ton of wind in your sails and having that totally knocked out of you, um, up, you know, a couple days later, it is a lot of up, ups and downs, but we feel like now we're really on this great trajectory. And a lot of that came from landing that big enterprise deal that helped us sort out um, what do big companies want and what do they need. And for our particular SaaS model, um, that's that's the business, that's the the um, sale that we want to go after. We want to really target these large enterprises. Um, there's a lot of easy ways and, and other free tools available that are in our space for small teams, um, but there's not a lot available that helps big organizations connect these problems across the organization the way that Scatterspoke does. So we're super excited. That's everything I've got. Oh, one more. Um, and that's what's what's next for us. So going into 2021, we're continuing to focus on these large enterprises and really trying to find alignment with um, some different agile frameworks, things like scaled agile. Um, there's a couple new players in the market around different frameworks for large organizations going through transformation efforts. Um, another big focus for us going into 2021 is integrations. So we're we've already got thing, we've got integrations with Slack and with Jira. 
Um, we're going to focus heavily on adding a lot more um, integrations to that list going into next year and continuing to target these, these big enterprise contracts. That's everything I've got. That's our road to 10K MRR. We'll go ahead and kick it back to you, Rob. All right. Thank you so much, Colleen. We are going to have um, some audience questions coming through. And before we do that, uh, I have a couple for you. So I appreciate your thoughts on mall rats. <laughs> However, <laughs> so Kevin Smith's first film was Clerks. And it was oh. a black and white film that he made for like 25K of credit card debt. Yeah, and so I, I own, I'm like the, the comic book nerd. So I own, the, I think they call it the Unholy Trilogy, right? It's like mall rats, Chasing Amy, and, uh, and Dogma. Um, and he's another one that like didn't ask for permission, you know, and he went off and started his own podcast network because he got tired of kowtowing to uh, the Hollywood. So all rats. Were good. What was the budget for mall rats? I think it was a quarter million dollars. Oh, yeah, it was pretty small. I mean, no, 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 that's actually incorrect. Mall rats was like five or six million. And he didn't like having so much money because he had to blow it. And then he, when he came back to make Chasing Amy, he made it for a quarter million dollars. And that was, again, it was like he preferred to be that scrappy bootstrapper to not be on the hook for that huge budget and feel all the pressure. It's kind of like raising venture capital, right? You yeah. raise 10 million versus, you, you know, you bootstrap or you raise 100K. It's like such a different, such a different game. Have you seen Clerks? Yes, definitely. I've seen them all. What do you, Dogma. What do you Dogma. like, Mall Rats or Clerks? I like Mall Rats better than Clerks, but Dogma is definitely my favorite. Yeah, yeah, I think mine too. Uh, Producer Xander, could I get a little more of Colleen in my monitor? I'm having trouble hearing her a little bit. All right, so I'm curious. Um, oh, we have a, awesome. I was going to start asking you my questions, but I'd love to get live questions from the audience. So the first question from James McBrien. He says, what were the key changes that opened up the enterprise pipeline for you? You know, I'm, I don't know if I have a really solid answer here. We, um, I think starting to, so I started really doing a lot of public speaking in 2017 and speaking at conferences. We still until this year haven't spent any money on advertising that includes even just Google AdWords. Um, so all of our users and all of our traffic came from um, presenting at conferences, word of mouth, people seeing reviews on different networks um, or hearing other, you know, other coaches or scrum masters talking about what do you use for retros. Um, so I think a lot of what opened up that opportunity for us enterprise wise has been um, these tight knit communities. And, and Corinne talked about this too, of like finding your audience, finding who are the people that are the ones going to search for a tool so that they, that you can really target having a presence in that in that space. And so for us, that's a lot of things. LinkedIn is like Facebook for agile coaches. It's kind of funny. Um, and then there's a lot of different forums that are very specific to agile practices and how to run great retros where we've um, made sure that we are, our voice is heard in those forums too. So I, people just have found us through things like that. Very cool. And I'm curious, um, you talked about the competition that started springing up and charging in the uh, well, I can't see your slide, but I forget if it was 2017 or 18 time frame. Was that, you, you mentioned it was motivating. Um, was it also intimidating a bit or was it only positive for you? Oh my God, it's still intimidating. <laughs> that, that hasn't gone away. And I think I, you know, it's been, it's been interesting because we came out with like $39 a month plan and then we dropped it to 29 and then we dropped it to 25. And at one point, you know, before we signed that big contract, we were like, let's just make it $19 a month. We've been all over the place in terms of what to charge and what does that include? Um, and even just pushed out some new changes in April around our pricing. Um, I think that's been a good lesson in part of the Tiny Seed Mentor program is that, that that's okay. And that's a normal kind of journey for a startup to take is to continue to play around with that pricing. But um, we spent a lot of time initially looking at our competitors and saying, you know, what do we have that they have or what do they have that we don't have and how do we price according to, to what they've got? Um, I think not until this year would I say that we've gotten to the point where we don't care. <laughs> we don't care what they have or what they're charging. I think we have a pretty good understanding of what we offer and, and what the value there is, um, especially knowing that it's an enterprise that's paying for it, right? It's not, it's not often somebody pulling out their own credit card um, to pay for our tool. So knowing right, that we're, yeah. Keep going, keep going with that. Yeah, so knowing that it's like a big enterprise that's writing a, a check for an entire year of service or license seats, it's kind of changed our approach to what we charge. And I think that that's given us a little bit more confidence in where we're at now. And I think more flexibility in continuing to change it going forward. Yeah, 
And that's such a big, I mean, a part of the, a key part of what you just said is you used to be really concerned about what your competitors were pricing and how they were arranging that. And now you're kind of confident that you're doing the right thing based on your customers. That's such a part of product market fit that people don't realize or don't talk about is once you have the confidence in, um, in what you're doing and what the feedback you're getting and it's just working and you're signing these big deals, that is, again, a component of you know, what I would, I would call product market fit. Because until you're starting to feel decent about your pricing, I don't, I don't think that you have that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to, I think it's hard, you know, we even had a, a huge company come to us at one point and ask for a quote for an enterprise contract. And when we provided them a number, um, the person on the, on the phone was like, I don't understand how you can charge that much. It's just a whiteboard tool. Like it's just sticky notes. And so we, you know, we got defensive, I think initially, and we were like, oh no, but here's all the other things it could do. And here's how it, it's useful. And then it was like, you know what? Um, thank you for your feedback and, you know, explore other options. And if you change your mind, come back to us. Um, so it's it's hard. The pricing game is a hard one to I think find find that groove and feel confident, like you said, that, that what you're offering matches up with what you're charging. Yep. Yeah. It's so easy to be so fragile. It's like, um, yeah, it's like your feelings or your ego are tied up in it. I mean, every time I've launched a new product or service or conference or accelerator or anything, it, it's just the first like five conversations you have when people don't like it. You're like, oh no, this is never going to work. We can't possibly make this work. But you know, obviously, obviously you do because you're on the road to 10K here. Uh, we have a question from Dominic Taylor, and he says, how do you know when to leave the day job? How do you think about that, weighing that, you know, that, because we all have responsibilities and everything. Yeah, it's super hard. I mean, um, actually joining Tiny Seed was the catalyst for us to be able to make that happen. Um, I had I had branched off and started doing consulting, you know, under my own business uh, about two years ago. And that really helped me make the jump into making Scatterspoke our full-time, you know, our full-time business. So we started to tiptoe into other ways, I think, to supplement income to get us there. And now my husband's full-time on this as well, but it's, it's hard. I mean, I think that there's, there's all these things, right. Of understanding what your threshold is, um, feeling like you have enough socked away in case things don't work out for a couple months. I mean, for, I would say up until 2019, we were spending more just on like hosting and emailing services than we were ever making on the tool. So it's been pretty new to be um, even marginally profitable, let alone to the point where we could um, thinking about supporting our family this way. So taking the tiny seed investment definitely helped us get there, even though we've been spending that on other things as well. But I think there's a lot of personal factors that go into that around what your threshold is for for risk and what does your day job look like, right? I mean, that was a big factor for me of, um, you know, at any time I can jump back into coaching and teaching and helping helping agile teams. And so I think you also have to weigh what the climate looks like for the industry that you're in so that if you need to, if you need to go back, that option's on the table. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. I mean, I think the there's probably three or four cases where I think of people leaving or the road to leaving the day job. One is, and I know, I have friends and colleagues who've done exactly these. One is you save up enough money that you don't need to work for 18 months and then you try to do it. And that's a little scary and most people can't do it, but that's one way. Another is to raise a small amount of funding to cover yourself for the 12 to 18 months. Um, another is to stair step your way up and either use products, other products or use consulting to kind of transition that. And the fourth one really is to have a partner, you know, a supportive partner who's kind of willing to support you during that. So it's figuring out other streams of revenue um, to do it. And then knowing your own, you know, some people are willing, uh, the story of like customer.io, they had almost no revenue and they like both quit their day jobs. And that would freak me the hell out. Like I didn't do, I mean, I had eight grand a month coming in before I quit my day job and it was enough to cover the mortgage and all the stuff. And that, I think it just depends on maybe risk tolerance, you know? Yeah. And I think that's compounded, right? When it's a husband and wife um, founder yeah. situation, because it's like, if this fails, we're both out of a job. So right. there's some yeah, interesting it's, pressure it's, added by that. Absolutely. All right. Another question from George I. Nikolev. He says, what was, this is a tough one, actually. I'm curious to hear your take. What was the key to nailing down product market fit for you? Um, honestly, listening, you know, I think this is, I think one of the things that's been kind of challenging in, in building this product is I am super close to the users and super, I am the demographic, right, that we're selling to. So I get excited and I get all these ideas about things that I want to build and that I want to do and that I want to see, um, and I think when we go down that path often, especially, you know, I get excited about the features. My husband gets excited about the technology and starts building all these things. And, you know, it takes us, then we end up with like a six month release, which is 
not really very agile when you think about it. It's not what we coach other people to do. Um, we build these huge releases that take forever to get out the door. And we're doing, you know, a Hail Mary once we put those out to find out if it's stuff that people like. Um, and honestly, like production is the most expensive place you can test out an idea. So one of the things that I think has really helped us is not building so much stuff until people ask for it. And that that enterprise deal that we got at the beginning of 2018 really set us up for that. Um, we had to shelve a bunch of stuff that we were excited to build and listen to what they wanted us to add to the tool in order to support a 2000 person organization. And that, you know, it kind of changed things for us and also helped us going forward with other contracts. So now when we go to the table and start to work with these large enterprises, one of the first things we ask is, are there things that aren't in the tool that you're interested in having added to the tool? And even if it's, you know, we've had, we have a recent one that was a laundry list of stuff. And when we came to them with a price to add it all, they said, just add this one thing. Um, but now we have a, you know, we have a whole backlog of other things they'd like to see added that are probably things other organizations want added too. So a big part of it, I think, has just been listening, like finding who who's our optimal customer and listening to their needs. Yep, very nice. All right, a reminder to folks in uh in remote, um, click the question button and submit your own question if you have any questions for Colleen. We have uh, almost another five minutes to go. I have another question, um, this one from Jack Dempsey. How have you navigated the challenges of being married to your co-founder? Any <laughs> tactics, strategies, or principle to help, principles to help make this work? Good question. Yeah. Well, lots more Coors Light, clearly. We're in Colorado, so <laughs> that helps. Um, no, in, in all honesty, I think some of the things that we've really figured out help us are um, things that I think would help any co-found like co-founders. We try to um, we use Jira for our work. We have a Kanban board where we track priorities. We use that with our contractors, um, whether it's marketing folks now or dev folks. Um, we try to communicate in Slack a lot, even though we're sitting usually two feet apart from each other. So we use Slack for everything so that we can see what each other's communicating, especially when it's like third party contractors, so that I know if he's told the developer, you don't have to build this thing. Um, that way I don't yell at him later. <laughs> and then we also block off times. We block off different times during the week where we either look at the backlog together, or we look at our metrics together, um, because I think it can be like we both get, like I said, we both get excited about the things that we're passionate about and kind of go down different paths. And we've, we've had that bite us in the ass before where we're both going so far away from what each other's working on because we assume we're, you know, we assume because we're in the same house, we're going down the same road and, and we're not. And so we try to, um, going into this year, set up some more regular check-ins where we're making sure that we're working together on the same things and our priorities are lining up. Um, and that the kids aren't there. We have three kids. So it's, it's chaos here right now with kids being home from school and daycares being closed. So um, it's, I think that makes it even more important to carve out specific time to take care of those tasks on a regular basis. Sounds like lots of communication. Yeah. We have a question from Hector de Pereda and he says, how do you decide to target small business, small and medium sized businesses versus big corporations as a bootstrapped company? In your experience, which are the pros and cons of each? Um, so for us, I think we still target those small, small to medium businesses, and we we have a lot of them using the tool now. And I would say a lot of those kind of tend to sit in the like hundred user seat type of bucket. Um, the organization might be bigger, but it tends to be like a hundred licenses that they're looking for, um, and they're awesome to work with. We get a ton of feedback from them. I think you know we're getting to the point now where we've got a few small, small, medium sized businesses where we can kind of experiment with them. So like we're 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 pushing out a beta version of a Canvas board that's more like a whiteboard, um, where you can post things and they're not in columns, and it'll still pull all that you know pull all of that back into our analytics and. Um, we can push that now out to some of these smaller businesses and, and test it with them and get feedback from them. And that's a cool relationship to have that I think would be a little harder to do when there's 2000, you know, 2000 users. Um, but for us, you know, a lot of, uh, and, and they tend to onboard quicker. I would say that's the other piece with small to medium business businesses is it's pretty self-service. They can kick that off. There's not a long contract. So we love that part of it. It's kind of instant revenue. <laughs> Enterprises tend to take a long time. I mean, these can be like up to six months of back and forth legal, security reviews. Um, but once we do finally close those, I mean, it 
like like I said, it'll two enterprise deals doubles our MMR where we're at right now. So um, I think that's the other part that's kind of, you know, from a from a focus perspective, we want to keep focusing on these enterprise deals because they're they're um, a lot more lucrative and then they're usually a year long contract, if not three. So that tends to be another piece that these big companies want to buy a tool for for like a three year minimum. Um, so once we go through the long road to get there, we're, we're really locked into that revenue for a decent amount of time. Yeah, I think that's good perspective. I mean, the, the sales cycles are really long with enterprise, but man, the churn is just, all, they don't want to change unless there's a real problem. They sign these long contracts. And there's this other thing I'll say versus going after small, medium versus enterprise is if you can build a business that actually has a, I call it a dual funnel where you have people coming in paying a low price and high volume and you can build it like a nice brand, but then you also have the enterprises coming in. That's an amazing business. Those are the ones I see growing the fastest. So Drip was like that, where we had a $50 starter plan, but we had people coming in paying us $1,000 a month when they had a huge list. Uh, Squadcast, who we'll hear from a little later, you know, it's a podcast recording. And they, of course, have the fly fisherman who's paying them $15 a month. And then you might have a huge, you know, uh, you can imagine like a podcast network coming in and paying them thousands a month. Those funnels are, are really quite amazing. So, all right, Colleen, thank you so much. We're at time. I really appreciate you coming on to MicroConf Remote today. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. This was great. Hey everyone, I am Meryl Johnston and here today to talk about business finances and specifically how to become a financially savvy SaaS founder. I always like to ask, why should I listen to someone on a particular topic? And here's a little bit about me. I come at business finances from both an accounting perspective, so I'm a trained accountant, chartered accountant, which is like a CPA in the US, but I'm also a founder and I've scaled my business, Bean Ninjas, up to a team of 15 people over the last five years. I realise this is a virtual event. I, I add a couple of extra things about me, particularly when it's an in-person event and then we can connect and, and chat over something that might not be accounting related and maybe it's surfing or parenting or, or something different. So feel free to connect with me afterwards and to have a chat about either this topic or, or something else uh, that, about this that, is, uh, that, that you're interested in. The way that I thought we'd frame this is to look at four different stages of business, of particularly related to SaaS, and look at what the financial challenges are related to these. Millionaire Mary, we're going to leave for today. The financial challenges that I would normally talk about there are related to preparing business for exit. And instead, we're going to focus on CEO Carl, who is building a leadership team and really in the process of scaling. And he's ready to be adopting best practices when it comes to the finance function in his business. But we're also going to have a look at Hustling Hector and Stressed Out Susie, who are a bit earlier stage, and look at well, what are some things that they could implement or take action on today that are going to help them build out this best practice finance function and also have a look at well, well why would you even care about business finances in your business so ceo carl he's been in business for a while now and he's he's got a team and really trying to build out a leadership team so that he can take a bit more time away from business he can take a day off here and there but it's still quite difficult for him to to take a week or two weeks or a month off. And so he knows that he really needs to get his financial house in order. And there's three main things that he needs to do in order to assist with that. The first is making sure that there's a clear set of deliverables and a timeline. So what actually needs to happen? What are the deliverables or the results that we're aiming for? And this would be similar, there would be a marketing and sales function in the business as well. And again, there'd be a clear set of deliverables. It might be writing a blog post or, or whatever it is. The next component of that is having documented SOPs so that it's really clear about how these things need to be done and that they can be done consistently and you've got backups in place if something's happened to different team members. And then the last is looking at, well, what financial reports should you be looking at as a founder? 
and how can you use dash uh, dashboards. Right, let's start off with the bookkeeping timetable. And really here I'm interested in well, who needs to do what by when. And the deliverable is typically month-end reports that would include a profit and loss on income statement and a balance sheet. And there's probably some other more specific reports that are customised to your business as well. And in order to do that, there's a number of steps that need to be completed before we can get to the reports. And so we need to know well, what are those steps, who needs to do them and, and when do they need to be completed by. And the way I like to break it down is to look at, well, what are some of the monthly tasks? Okay, in, in order to finalise any month, then there's a number of steps that we need to do. You might pay your suppliers and your team fortnightly, right? So that's in the fortnightly category. There might be some weekly tasks and, and then daily. This is just a template. You would adapt this to your business. As I said, what's really important here is getting clear on what the deliverable is and then who needs to do what by when in order to achieve it. The next part of that is the how, which is the standard operating procedures. And due to time constraints, I, I won't go into examples of standard operating procedures, but the finance function is very similar to other areas of your business in that you would have a defined way of doing things, whether it was a defined way of paying your suppliers, a defined way of preparing your end of month reports, the fine way of chasing out customers. If you're doing something like enterprise sales rather than having customers on direct debit or, or they're paying for implementations. The next thing I wanted to talk about is having, as a founder, having access to metrics and some kind of weekly dashboard that really helps you keep a finger on the pulse. Typically, even though we're aiming for monthly reports, typically many founders that I speak with and not actually getting reports on a timely basis, which is making it hard for them to make decisions. So, so on the one hand, I encourage you to get your, your bookkeeper or your accountant to get reports to you quickly within 10 business days after the end of each month. But the other component of that is what metrics can you track on a regular basis to get a feel for what might lie ahead. And these are metrics that I track this report, I, I get this report on a weekly basis and that goes to my management team. And this really helps us from a sales and marketing perspective, we have an idea of the pipeline. From a delivery perspective, we can track how we're going and then also looking at onboarding and cash flow too. So the metrics and the key drivers of your business will be different. For example, if you're offering free trials and then you've got an idea around conversion right there, you might be tracking how many new people signed up for a free trial. Or if you're doing enterprise sales, then you might have a sales section that looks a bit like this, where you know that typically 10 calls results in two customers or a certain dollar value of revenue. And so this really gives you an idea of, of how you're tracking. These dashboards can be, they can be tracked in Excel and Google Sheets. I think that that's fine. It's a good way to start out. And there's also dashboarding tools where you can bring in data sources from multiple different platforms. And I think uh, Brian, who is also in this community has, I hope I'm getting the name right here, I think it's called Sunrise KPI, where you can track KPIs as well. So that's another option for you too. The key steps in, in this being meaningful or giving you meaningful information are one, actually figure out what metrics uh, the drivers of your business and, and it may be different and then what's an effective way to track them and then three carving out time to look at the numbers coming to you. Now I wanted to go back a step so we've looked at Carl and really what a best practice finance function would look like where there's a, a really clear set of deliverables everyone's clear on who needs to do what by when the how is documented in SOPs and then there's financial reports coming in within 10 days after the end of each month. And there's a dashboard that's being looked at on a weekly basis with the key metrics of the business. That's where we're aiming for. But if you're just starting out, you're probably not at that point yet. And actually you probably should be focused on other things like making sales and, and trying to increase MRR, monthly recurring revenue. But there definitely are some simple things that you can do today to help with the financial side of your business. If you're hustling Hector, so you're just starting out, don't have any employees yet, 
got some freelancers that are helping to build your product. Some of the things that you can do are to implement cloud accounting software. I use Zero, then there's other tools like QuickBooks out there. What's important here is that it connects to your bank account and also has the ability to connect to other apps or add-ons too, so that you're reducing the amount of data entry required and eliminating risk of errors. So having zero set up really helps, but also being disciplined with firstly setting up business bank accounts and then using them only for business purposes. Personal bank accounts for personal, business bank accounts for business. And it sounds quite simple, but I often, this is often where I see a bit of a mess when people are just getting started with building their finance function. And then the third, receipt management. Again, it sounds simple and it should be simple, but again, something that typically isn't done well, particularly by founders in their first couple of years. Just pick a receipt management process and, and stick to it. You might pick Dropbox or Google Drive, it might be an email, but something, all of your receipts should be going to one location. Typically travel costs are handled poorly. We're doing less of that at the moment. So if you've got physical receipts from buying meals out, hotels, things like that, take photographs and again, save them to whatever system that you're using and that will save you a lot of headache at tax time. Stress out Susie, sorry, stress out Sophia is, she's a little bit further along than Hector. She's starting to transition her team of freelancers into a team of employees, just scaling up the businesses, growing, she's got more customers. And really for her, the main issue is around cash flow. There's more pressure on her to make sure that there's enough money to pay her employees. Some of the things that she can do, assuming that she's already put in place the, the three points that we talked about with Hector, which were getting zero or other cloud accounting software, using business bank accounts and receipt management. So she's got all of that happening. Really, she should then be able to review a set of reports, the profit and loss and balance sheet at a minimum every month. And she should be able to have those reports come out of something like zero and either work with a bookkeeper or an accountant or someone in-house, or maybe it's, it's her, to, to check those numbers and make sure that they're accurate. Last thing you want to do is make decisions based on what you saw in your financial statements and for them to have not been accurate. And, and there's checks and balances that you can do. And my second dot point here around financial literacy skills also really helps. And I think every founder should have a baseline level of finance skills, some knowledge of accounting and bookkeeping and some knowledge of taxes as it applies to the country and the location that you're in. And there's books you can read, courses that you can do. And I think every founder should invest in developing some of these skills and, and enough to know that when you are hiring an accountant or bookkeeper, you can ask the right questions and you can know that they're doing a good job. And also it gives you confidence in when, when you're reviewing financial reports that you can use that information to make good decisions, not rely on other advisors. So if we do a little bit of a recap, we spent most of today talking about CEO Carl and what a best practice finance function looks like. And the reason I wanted to do that was to paint the picture of, of as your business, where, when your business scales up, what it can and should look like, so something to aim for. But I also wanted to talk about some earlier stages of business. So we talked about hustling Hector and stressed out Sophia, who were at the early stages of their entrepreneurial journey and some of the things, more simple things that they could implement today to really help them on that path to where CEO Carl is. That's it from me. I'd love to connect. I'm definitely more active on LinkedIn than I am on Twitter, but here are the, the options if you would like to connect. Mr. Martin, how are you doing, sir? Very well. Happy to be here. This is Andy Martin. He has over 10 years of technical and management experience in building, designing, and constructing control systems 
and project management, most of which, that was a mouthful, most of which were with mission critical facilities like data centers and hospitals. He holds a master's of science in software engineering from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, which of course is why he can join me here today because he's local to the cities. And you will know that we are properly socially distancing, even though it looks uh, like we're far away. Um, he has had full responsibility for tons of scopes of work, uh, including P&L on many multi-million dollar complex contracts, like data centers, hospitals, and even an NFL stadium. And I can guess which one that is, I, I think. Take a wild guess, you'll probably be pretty wild close. Guess. He can't tell anyone, but you know, we live here at uh, where the Vikings play. So Andy is the president and founder of Blue Rhythm, which is SaaS, focused on streamlining mission critical and commercial commissioning efforts. And so people who have no idea what that is, I'm gonna talk a little bit. So I was a, uh, an electrician for just like a, the blink of an eye before I decided I wanted to go write code for a living. And I remember on one of these things, so we were installing pipe and running wire. And I remember it, we built a big data center in the, and I say we, I was like an apprentice, right? But we built a big data center in the Bay Area. And I had to carry around this clipboard and I had to follow an engineer around. And it was a big checklist of all this stuff as they would turn on the, the uninterruptible power supplies, the UPSs, and then they would turn the generator on and they'd make sure that the fail safe tripped and there was an automatic switch breaker and blah, blah, blah. And you had to test all this crap because once it's live and you have a thousand servers in there, it can't break, yep. right? And so that's commissioning. Yep. And that's what Blue Rhythm does is it takes that clipboard or the five clipboards that we used to carry around and all the paper yep. that we then had to fax to people, right? That's how old I am. And it puts it into SAS. Exactly. Is that the idea? Exactly, yeah. It's just a, it's a project management tool for that specific situation. So, you know, if you're the person building the data center, you might hire uh, somebody who's one of our customers. And our customers will take our software and they'll go through their checklist. Uh, it'll create the reports for them and it's really kind of automate everything. Right. And I love it because it's such a niche, right? There's, there's so much value in not, you know, you're not competing against... Um, whatever, MailChimp is an ESP, or you know, uh, these other big players, Google, like you've picked such a small slice that really, you know, Microsoft's not gonna come build commissioning software, right. you know, or Google or Facebook. Like right. you are in a place, obviously you have big, bigger competitors than you, but um, it's not something that they're gonna come and attack. And you, I asked you about MRR, um, you're in your five figure MRR, which for folks who are counting, it's, that means $10,000 or more in MRR, just to give you an idea of, you know, of where he lands. Um, your, yeah, your Minneapolis base, I think we already mentioned that, which is why we can hang out. And really my first serious question for you is long board or short board, sir? Actually wakeboard. Wakeboard. As a Western kid, that's, uh, that's kind of what I've grown up doing and actually did a round this past weekend, which I'm still feeling the effects a of. A store from, yeah, so wakeboard, you pull on the back of a boat, right? And you yep. stand up on it. So yep. it's, it's as close as you can kind of get to surfing on the Yeah, exactly. Water. That's how you surf in the Midwest, yeah. I guess. 10,000 lakes, you don't have much tide for a long board. So obviously this was a pain point, you know, to build Blue Rhythm, like the origin story. Since you were involved in this commissioning, this was a pain point that you were experiencing. But you weren't a developer. I know you had toyed around with some stuff, but like, what made you think that you could build the prototype of Blue Rhythm not having ever built, you know, really built production code? Yeah, so I guess I didn't know for sure that I could, but I also didn't know that I couldn't. So I really just wanted to try. Um, so that's what I did. I just kind of started tinkering at first and just kind of testing the waters. I tested the mark a little bit. I did some outreach, um, just put some feelers out and it just kept building and building and I got good response from people and decided to just keep at it. Yeah. Yep. And so when you started building Blue Rhythm, was there existing software already doing this? And if so, why did you think, you know, what edge did you think you had? What did you think you could do better? Sure. So, yeah, there, there were some existing solutions out there. So that gave me just a little bit of confidence that there, there was a market. You know, there was people paying money for a solution like this. Um, but the, the existing options were either real old legacy platforms that were kind of on the downslope of their, their life cycle. Um, or there's a, there's a couple newer, real modern SaaS, you know, web-based uh, web platforms that are out there. And um, they just have real clunky pricing models. They're not as easy to do business with. Uh, so I felt like there was an opportunity to, to get in. It's not a saturated market. Um, over half of this industry is not using a, a SaaS solution right now. They're using a combination of homegrown tools, access databases, maybe some cloud file storage. So lots of opportunity for them to streamline and really come on board with a you know, modern web platform to manage yeah. their projects. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. And so how, in an industry like this, obviously you're not going to be able to run... Um, 
I shouldn't say not, but I, I would guess, I'm guessing Facebook ads is not going to work in your space, you know, and even like Google AdWords and LinkedIn are going to be a tough, they're going to be tough traffic channels. So, you know, are there a couple kind of lead gen avenues that have really worked for you? Yeah, it's, it's been tricky. It's still, it still is tricky. Um, so w whatever we do, it just has to be very, very targeted. So yes, Facebook ads are difficult. Um, we're trying some different things with um, just promoting uh, blog posts to a retargeted audience or lookalike audiences, so still very, very narrow. Um, same thing with, with Google Ads. So any paid, paid acquisition, we're, we're keeping it very small, uh, very focused. And the things that have really, I think, moved the needle are kind of the in-person events. So we go to industry conferences. It's such a small community that if you're not at those events, you're really kind of not part of the the industry and the, and the community. So, you know, last year, once we, once we started showing up to those events, it really just gets our name out there. People see that we're serious and we're, we're here to stay and, and make a long-term push uh, in the market. So the in-person events at conferences, you know, setting up a booth, talking to people face-to-face -face, and cold outreach has been a, a good channel for us too, um, which is difficult and there's some good and bad ways to do that, but um, had some success there. Just some people just, you know, aren't, aren't aware or, um, just aren't currently, you know, in the mindset where they're looking. So they just need that, that little extra prompt to, to get them interested. Yep. Yeah, and that's the thing is, you know, I'll hear people say that, let's say cold email is dead or that, um, you know, trade shows and events aren't worth it. But in these small niches where there are only thousands of potential customers, you know, or maybe tens of thousands, but there aren't that many, mm -hmm. that oftentimes that still works. You know, if yep. you're trying to cold email, um, I'm trying to, you know, if you're trying to cold email startup founders today, or, or startup executives or whatever, that's a, it's pretty saturated. It's still possible, you can, but it, it takes a lot of time. But in a space like that, that maybe isn't inundated, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, of room there. Yep. So you started working on Blue Ribbon part-time about four years ago, it was 2016. Um, you toiled part-time for two years and you, you know, you told me offline before we chatted, you had a bunch of beta users coming really early. They would come in, they'd use it and they would churn out. Like yep. What was going on there? What was the issue? Because I'm sure there are folks listening right now who are in exactly the same position that you were two years ago. Yeah, so for better or worse, I, I took the path of getting something put together, getting a usable product. I don't know if you call it an MVP or not, but getting something there where people could come in and use it. Um, so I was, I was just testing the product, testing to see what, what people would respond to. Um, and I got a huge amount of feedback. So... Uh, it's, it's not an approach that, that would work or I would advise in all situations, but um, for me, never having started a, a business before, let alone a software company, getting, that, getting all that feedback early on really drove the direction that uh, we ended up taking the company. And I think without that feedback, we would have toiled a lot longer and, and had a lot more difficulty reaching the point where we finally feel like we have product market fit, um, where we've figured out these different marketing channels and stuff. So just lots of experimentation and some of those early adopters that are willing to give us a try, they're also willing to you know, tell you how bad it sucks or give you some, some feedback that'll get you going in the right direction. So um, that's, that's really what it, what it was. It just was a product that, that wasn't quite ready yet. Mm -hmm. And you know, so many developers that I know go in their basement for two years and just code and they don't have anybody use the app. Mm -hmm. Whereas you went counter to that. It sounds like intuitively your natural instinct was to let people use it early. Again, that's, even back in the day, that was not my instinct because I was scared and I, it was never good enough and it was never there. What, why do you think you did that? Why do you think you did the opposite of what most people do? Um, par partly for the reasons I said and partly just out of ignorance. Um, <laughs> honestly, there were a couple times where I, I thought we had got it to a point where it was going to work and it was good enough, so to speak. Uh, but it wasn't, and those were the, just in terms of rejection and uh, just the emotional response that I had, those were some of the, the toughest times, but, um, uh, you know, I, I just stuck with it, and I was like, you know, there's, there's a response, people want this, if I keep at it, eventually we'll get this figured out, and eventually they'll, you know, the, the, the feedback will shift more to more <laughs> positive versus more negative. Right, yeah. well, that's what I was going to ask you about. You spent two years part-time, obviously you were probably working a day job, right? And you had yeah. nights and weekends working on Blue Rhythm. Two years is a long time. You're mm -hmm. getting rejection. People are churning out. Why didn't you quit? I think there was always enough momentum uh, for me to keep pushing forward. And, and I just had a strong desire to make it work. I'd always wanted to have something that I, that I owned, that I created. I just liked the 
the, the process of creating and getting the feedback, even though it's not always good, and, and, and taking that, adding it into the product, and then getting the feedback that says, hey, that's great. Thanks for, thanks for doing that. Um, so just the, just the desire to see it, to see it through and to, to, to see it work, and just knowing that the market was there. You know, it wasn't like I was trying to convince people to, to do something that they had never thought of or seen before. Right. Yeah. And then it was just about a year ago, it was mid-2019, that you, you kind of call your soft launch, right, where mm -hmm. you actually feel like you kind of went all in. Um, you said this is when things started growing for you. And I'm curious, is that when you went full-time? It is, yeah, May last year. May of last year. Yep. And did you have enough revenue to cover your, you know, expenses, or did you have savings, or did you just jump off the diving? Um, yeah, I didn't, wasn't quite at a point where the, the business alone would have um, kept me going. So I had a fallback plan, which was some savings, which I did use some of. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I, I just had confidence that we were close enough to, to product market fit that it was going to work. Yep. Um, just because of our, who our customers are and, and how our pricing model works, it makes sense most of the time for people to pay annually. Mm -hmm. So even though our MRR, you know, is maybe in four figures, the actual amount of money coming in the door was, yep. you know, in five fig figures potentially or, or higher four figures. So um, I, just, I just had confidence that it was going to work out one way or another. And, you know, worst case, I, like I told you, I end up living in my parents' basement for a little bit, but... <laughs> it happens. It, 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 sacrifices uh, we make, right? As yeah. Entrepreneurs, yeah. So, Pulled the trigger. I figured if, if I'm going to make it work, I got I to gotta be all in. And, and that's, the, that's when I jumped off. Yep. And I, so the, he, he just said a, a pretty cool hack that I've heard many people mention. I've actually done it myself. Jason Cohen talked about it um, in, in one of the best talks about bootstrapping uh, ever called backing. What is it? Yeah, building the ideal bootstrap business, I believe. But it's the annual prepay. And if you're in a space where, as a bootstrapper, you can get your customers to annually prepay. You typically give them two months off is how you know, I would often work it. So you give them about a 16 mm -hmm. and two-thirds percent discount. Um, then your cash flow is way more than your MRR, but that can allow you to either hire someone or allows you to quit your day job or whatever it is. I'm curious. So you had this two years of just to two or three years of kind of toiling part-time and um, struggling. People are churning out. Then you you had enough traction that you're like, I think we're almost at product market fit. And, and then you did, you have achieved it at this point. Um, what changed between that early high, those early high churn days and the past 12 months of kind of as your growth has accelerated? Like what's, what's different? Yeah, I, I can't point to one specific thing, but it's definitely just a, you know, a combination of um, getting the, getting the, the messaging and the marketing, the positioning figured out. Uh, you know, so we're, 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 we're talking to the right people. We're having the right people coming to, to talk to us about signing up. Um, so they know what they're getting into. We know who we're talking to and, and what the, you know, our ideal customer is looking for. And then just having that much time to, to work on the product and, and get it ready and, and get, you know, as closer. I, I can't say that we're hundred percent there, but getting much, much closer to product market fit. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Such an evolving process and it's not binary, right? It's a continuum. It's like you notch it up from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, 60, 70, and then oftentimes you'll find a new audience. And I don't know in your tight niche if it'll do that, but then you find a new audience that finds out about you and then your aggregate product market fit actually goes down again and then you have to work because the new audience, you don't quite have it, right? You don't have sure. all the features. Yep. Um, as, as we kind of wrap up, I, you know, you're, you're in Tiny Seed Batch 2. Yep. And um, I'm curious, why, like what made you decide to, well, I'm, first I'm curious how you heard about Tiny Seed, and second, what made you decide to apply? Because the application, you know, you went um, middle of, of 2019, you went full time, mm -hmm. and you would have applied probably four or five months later. It would have been November of 2019, yep. and then you would have been accepted, I think, you know, about six, seven months ago. So first, you know, where'd you hear about it, and second, what made you decide to apply? So I had been a listener of Startups for the Rest of Us for a long time. Um, so I, I, that's probably where I heard about it or just something related to that, that channel. Um, and the idea was to, it wasn't so much a, a, a safety net, so to speak, but it was originally planned to be kind of an accelerant. So there were some other parts of the, the platform that we really needed to, to reach, to, to really get our platform built out and get to parity and exceed parity with the other options out there. And the plan was to take that and really just kind of throw the fuel on the fire. I feel like, I felt like we had a really good idea of what we needed to do at that mm -hmm. point, And I just wanted to do it faster, yeah. really. And has it accelerated for you? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yep. 
Well, sir, we're at time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. All right, great having you. Hello, and welcome to your five minute SEO hack. In this hack, we want to be using free Google tools to find opportunities within existing content. And then I'll show you some tweaks that you can be making to rank for more keywords for pages that you already have. My name is Viola Eva and I run a company called Flow SEO, where we help digital businesses to rank on Google and increase their organic traffic. Here I've jumped into Google Search Console. Google Search Console is our opportunity to communicate with Google. Um, it is not Google Analytics. Google Analytics is something where you've probably in and bef in before, which allows you to look how many people visit your website and what do they do on your website. Google Search Console is more of your control center in which you communicate with Google. It allows you to see how many pages are indexed, if there are any errors, and it also gives you a brief keyword report. It's probably not the best keyword report to be found. That's what SEO tools are for. But once you set it up, it's free. So this is what's making it interesting. I'm here in the performance report and I've chosen to look at the last six months. Now I'm clicking here for average CTR and average position and I'm scrolling down to pages. What I'm looking for are pages where I'm stuck on page two or three or four of Google. These are the pages where Google is showing some interest. We are ranking, right? We made it to page two, but we're not getting the organic traffic that we deserve because Google thinks we're not quite relevant. So I'm looking here at the position column to kind of like find opportunities. And I basically want to see where I may be getting some impressions and some clicks, but not a whole lot. So this one here stands out to me and it stands out to me because it's a good, important keyword SEO agency Berlin, but it's really not getting any good like clicks that make it worthwhile. I could now click and see more details about that specific page. And I'm typing here to look at the queries. So here I can see all the keywords that I'm currently ranking for and that Google Search Console is tracking and showing to me. So this gives me an idea on where I'm doing well. So SEO agency Berlin, I can see, okay, I'm almost on page on the bottom of page one, position 10. That's quite good. But then for example, there's SEO company in Berlin where I'm in position 19. So I could be doing much better here. And this is also a keyword that has a lot better click through rate. So it might be interesting for me. So what I'm curious to understand is if I'm leaving any money on the table here with this keyword SEO company compared to my focus keyword SEO agency. So I'm jumping into the article and it basically allows me to have a look on what I have here. I'm th then use another free SEO tool called SEO Minion. And I can basically s click on analyze on page SEO and in I'm trying to understand if I did my SEO basics right. The SEO basics ha include adding my keyword into the URL, adding my keyword into the page title, and then adding it into my headline one and possibly a few subheadlines. I can see that I've done a really good job here. The keyword boutique SEO agency Berlin, it appears in some of the most important ranking factors. What I can never see here is the keyword SEO company. It doesn't appear in the subheadlines. It doesn't appear in the page title, meta description or URL. Now, one word of advice about URLs, you don't want to change and redirect your URLs in this case. This is really um, rolling the dice. If you create a new page, always make sure to keep it optimize your URLs. But if you're already on page two, I wouldn't dare to roll the dice and then just leave it at it is. So I'm jumping into the actual page and I'm typing the word company to see if I'm even using the word company. And I can see that I'm using it several times, but I'm always using it in the context of talking about my clients, basically SEO enables your company or your company's goal. Um, and then what else do we have here? Again, it's a SEO ordered for your company. Um, we will easily and breathe your company. So what I can see is in this entire page, the word SEO company Berlin actually never appeared. So this is actually a really, really good opportunity because I'm already in position 19 and I didn't even use that keyword. So if I can now start adding that keyword, um, my chance of improving is a lot better. Same here is like search engine optimization Berlin. I'm in position 22 and that probably doesn't even appear on the page. So by adding in those keywords that are 
that are doing somewhat well, but not super well, but not even appearing in the text, I can dramatically improve my chance of ranking. I have an SEO checklist that you can download here at flowseo.com slash content slash checklist. No opt-in, no sign up, no nothing. You just jump right into my content calendar template. And the parts that are interesting for you is the SEO checklist that starts here at column H. And it basically tell, tells you what you should be looking at. First, it asks you if you've done a good job with the main keyword, which is the most important keyword for the page. But then it also asks you, did I use my supporting keywords in the subheadline, in the body of text? And here I can see for the two keywords that were my opportunities, I didn't even do that. So now my job would be basically taking that page and making sure that I can confidently say yes for all these important on-page SEO factors. And this is how you can find SEO opportunities just by using the free Google Search Console and the SEO Minion plugin and a free spreadsheet that I offered you here. I hope you're gonna have fun with this and happy ranking. Our next keynote is from the co-founders of Squadcast. Squadcast.fm is podcast, it's remote podcast recording software. So you log into a web browser, you send a link to a guest, up to three guests, and you can all uh, just get in and instantly record local audio, super high quality. It's what I use to record all three of my podcasts. So Zach Moreno and Rock Felder, they've been friends for most of their lives, and they're lucky to have maintained that friendship as they built Squadcast into a company that has blown past 100K MRR. They've blown past that mark in the past year. And with that, let's welcome Rock and Zach to the show. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Hi, thanks, Rob. I'll let you Thank take you. it from me. Can you hear us, guys? Yep. All right. Well, hello right. to our friends at MicroConf. Thank you all for your time today. We're super excited, maybe even a little nervous about sharing our story with you on how we blew past 100K MRR. Just a warning, uh, it happened a little bit different than we expected, and we think it can for you, too. Uh, before we do get started with uh, the presentation, though, we would like to introduce ourselves. So, Zach, say hi and uh, tell them a little something about what you do at Squadcast. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Squadcast with my good friend, Rock. Yeah, and I'm Rock, and I'm the co-founder and CFO, so kind of handle uh, more of the business sales side of things. Okay. So, a little bit about our backstory. We're uh, longtime friends, as we shared. And we are avid podcast listeners. Rock actually introduced me to podcasts, and I've always loved listening because we have uh, we have a love for for learning new things. And podcasts are a fantastic way to go really deep into a niche topic uh, very quickly. And um, from there, we decided to make the the transition over the course of a couple of years later. Decided to make the jump from being a passive listener to to a lot of podcasts and really make the jump into being a, an active creator and participate in making our own show. We wanted to do a science fiction audio drama. So um, that's a relatively new category within podcasting and uh, just fell in love with that right away. So uh, once we started that journey, we had, a, we had a constraint of being a remote team and um, you know, like, like we are today. So uh, we, we didn't want to sacrifice the, the audio quality of our production. Uh, with uh, with that constraint of having a remote producer and voice actors and um, authors and all of those things, we we needed to have high quality production while having a distributed team to have any kind of regular cadence, which is super important to to podcast audience growth. So we we found that problem of of audio quality wasn't really there with the state of the art in in the industry and really saw that as a, as a challenge, kind of accepted that challenge and pivoted then from doing this sci-fi audio drama podcast to, uh, to a SaaS startup, which, uh, which is a first for us. So what we do, like Rob shared, we help professional podcasters record remote interviews in studio quality. So we help with recording thousands of hours each month in over 120 countries around the world. And uh, in the graphic, you can see there on the right, the, uh, oh, no? clicker. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. Cool, there we go. That's the graphic. All right, so um, we help podcasters, we do it a lot. And, um, and that UX is uh, very similar to other video apps and conferencing apps that you may have used. 
except that we record studio quality audio. Um, and we have two patents pending on our technology solutions for how we empower that style of recording. And uh, we've been bootstrapped and working on this for around four years now. All right, and uh, on this next slide, you'll see some of the companies that we're honored to work with, but we also get to work with a lot of amazing podcasters like Pat Flynn, Kara Swisher, people at the Spotify Gimlet teams and so many of those other companies that you see. Oh, excuse me. And the great Rob Walling too, like he mentioned. So yes, it's truly an honor. You, yeah. It's truly an honor to help that and so many other podcasters in various uh, places in their journey, whether they're just starting off or they're, uh, you know, a pro working for a big corporation. Uh, and these creatives really define the standards for audio quality in our industry. And uh, we're really helping to achieve it at scale. All right. But because we have such deep respect for the work that you all are doing, we need to be real with our fellow bootstrappers. It honestly felt like it took forever for us to reach 10K MRR, and um, that wasn't very long ago. Yeah, so um, we've never done any of this before. And uh, like Rock said, we respect all of you for going on a, on a similar journey. And uh, our founding team, have all had day jobs for for years into this experience together and uh and when we finally did reach 10k mrr um 100k just seemed like light years in the future from that and uh rock and i finally started paying ourselves in january of this year so still 2020 uh even though it has been kind of a, a dumpster fire in lots of ways uh that was a big milestone for us uh, so we suspect that uh, this may sound familiar to the to the journey that you're on. All right, so we're going to go back about a year when we did finally reach that 10k MRR um, milestone. And do you remember how good that felt, man? Like how I mean, we <laughs> felt like we made it. We felt like we were balling and we weren't yeah. paying ourselves. We were still operating on pretty minimal resources, but it it was a big moment. Yeah, it felt like it. It took forever uh, to get there and then lots of tweaks and listening and conversations uh, to even have a shot at doing that. And yeah, that that was a huge milestone for us. So uh, and, and it started to feel validating because like yeah. more uh, co other companies, entrepreneurs, fellow founders that we talked to, like it was like, oh, OK, 10K, like, we're good, you know, good job, boys. Finally. Yeah. Uh, years but yeah, later. <laughs> it felt like we were clawing our ways there. Yeah. on our way there. So uh, fast forward to uh, about a year. So a year later, May 2020, we hit 100k MRR. And uh, so much has changed and, and continues to evolve. And I think that's what's really fun about the journey is, is how things have changed and evolved. And we're going to walk you through some of the main reasons why we think we reached this uh, point. And yeah, just go over how it happened. All right. So after lots of reflection and kind of soul searching and really trying to unpack that that journey, uh, which we do as a practice kind of ongoing, but but this opportunity uh, to speak with you today really uh, was a was a great forcing function to, to look at this more deeply. And that's really where we we uh, realized that our story of this rapid growth really arcs across these three chapters of focus, reputation, and the final chapter, um, the final chapter we're going to keep as a surprise. So we'll, we'll keep you in suspense temporarily on that, but uh, stick with us. It'll be, it'll be worth your while. Yeah. Hopefully our marketing folks out there can appreciate the uh, mystique tactic. <laughs> All so right. the first one, uh, focus. So to be quite candid, the original vision for Squadcast was more or less pretty similar to, to what it is today. However, it was a bit inflated. We were kind of trying to do a little too much, to be honest. Thankfully, we we're really fortunate to get great advice from uh, our advisors, uh, our customers. And really what they told us was, we don't need you to be good at everything. We need you to focus on this one thing, and that is being experts at remote recording and really helping the industry and, and the creators in the space really understand 
what that is like, whether they're using Squadcast or not. There's a lot of opportunities for us to help. And of course, you know, we think once we can build up that reputation that, um, you know, that they'll come to us because we are the, the experts when it comes to recording their content remotely. Um, so really what they guided us to understanding was that was our role. Uh, it wasn't intuitive to us at first, but it was really about us really uh, putting our flag in the ground as, as establishing ourselves as experts. So one of the state, the sayings that's really stuck with me over the years is one that Dan Martell says, which is startups typically die and, um, not from indigestion, but due to starvation or not from starvation, but due to indigestion. Uh, so it's too much ideas, too much going on. Um, not a lack of ideas, which is kind of funny because at least at first when we were trying to, you know, start off Squadcast or I know you and me separately were each trying to do something more entrepreneurial and independent. It's like, well, what's going to be that idea? And, <laughs> and it turns out that's not the hard part. Um, yeah. So in addition to that, though, we we also learned that we needed to focus not just on being experts in this particular niche of podcasting, but also that we're, we're, we're SaaS founders, we're bootstrap SaaS founders. So really focusing on becoming professionals at be, being SaaS founders, specifically bootstrap uh, SaaS founders. So we did that by learning from the greats and really not just take, taking in that knowledge, but like applying that knowledge, like almost immediately. One of the things that uh, I don't know if you could call it a mantra or just a, a saying that we say a lot. It's not ours, so we're not trying to take it from anybody, but it's called just-in-time learning, that as things kind of come up during the, the founder entrepreneur journey, you can't know everything, but you, we got to get comfortable with at least learning on the fly. And so like understanding key topics like our unit economics, like pricing, I mean, we wouldn't be in this position today if we hadn't really taken it upon ourselves to really learn about those things because pricing was one of those things that guys like Rob Walling are always telling you it's a big deal. It's one of those levers that you can pull and, and truly transform, uh, transform the business. And, and it, it did like our revenue went up as you can imagine, but our churn went down and it's, it's exactly what they say. Another one is like kind of figuring out our customer support, uh, especially relative to the type of business model you have. So our, our business model is a little bit on the lower price side, but we were delivering high touch customer support, which can't scale and that it was never designed to scale it was designed to build relationships but just understanding the whys and um and learning from it and again like learning from it is one thing but actually implementing it is way harder i mean how how difficult was it to not just figure out what our pricing was but actually put it into place but boy was it worth it right difficult yeah to answer your question <laughs> one word <laughs> and uh now as part of tiny seed uh we're, we're seeing that have an impact uh again on the next iteration of our pricing but uh, but with our peer companies uh, that inspire us by uh, by making these these uh, improvements as well. So uh, so as founders like uh, like all of you and and us, uh, we're a finite and valuable resource. So uh, please don't waste any of your time working on stuff something that doesn't matter. Um, but Zach, you might be saying, how do we know what matters? Right, that's oversimplistic. Um, so much has been said about founders having extreme passion for the work that they're doing, but um, I, I would challenge you there or submit that what, what about your customers? Like, do they have passion for the problem that you're working to solve for them? If that's not the case, then it probably doesn't matter. That's probably a good indicator. So uh, the Based Camp team, uh, who we're big fans of, uh, coined the term JOMO, and uh, we love that. So uh, as a result of intense focus, uh, one result, I should say, of intense focus is that you will for sure miss out on other opportunities. And that's okay. Just accept that now, or we have anyway. What's JOMO mean? Uh, the joy of missing out. Mm. Excuse me. Yeah. Mm. So kind of, the, kind of a, a different take on FOMO. Um, so we have had plenty of huge opportunities and potential game changing ideas, pitches from VCs on pivot to this and we'll fund you or do this other thing at the same time as Squadcast. Um, so we've, we've had those, those ideas, uh, for, for other SaaS companies, um, but we've not pursued any of them with intention. Um, and I should say yet because we're focused because we're focused on realizing our potential within Squadcast, that's that's the opportunity at hand. So one thing about focus is uh, 
that is a constant struggle to maintain focus. So I would recommend that you stay mindful, check in with yourself, and just keep saying no to stuff that doesn't matter using that same approach that we shared before. Yeah, one of the things we said is like the bootstrapper's way is just inevitably to get good at saying no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, so we have reputation. Um, so if, if the problems you are solving, they do matter to customers, then there's likely going to be a community of people who that matters to. And we're all here because we're bootstrapping, which also means that we're investors in ourselves. So invest the resources that you have, uh, not just in your business, keep doing that, but also into the community that you're in service of. And you can do that by hosting meetups, by sponsoring conferences like this one, and, uh, and just generally fostering conversations. And uh, we're a bit biased, but we think that podcasting is a great way to have an ongoing dialogue with on, uh, within the topic uh, that, that you're an expert in and you're helping serve customers in. So um, if your customers are more involved in, in this community than your company is, then you're probably not, that's probably an indicator that you're not investing enough. So you want to invest more than them. And, uh, and that'll also help position you within the, the, their minds as being you know, part of this industry, part of this, this new category that you're working to create. So it's important to speak with your community, but it is more important, it's paramount, in fact, that you, you listen when you're having these, these conversations. I think our friend Colleen uh, mentioned listening is, is critical to their business. It's been critical to ours. We often say that uh, in an industry full of people who speak for a living, our superpower needs to be listening to them. So we practice that. And while you're investing in the community, it's, it's a good idea to listen more than you speak, like help catalyze these conversations, but then listen. The community will then invest feedback and ideas into your product. And uh, don't, don't stop there. Don't stop with listening. Uh, put it into practice. Actually do what they are telling you to do. And then, and this is kind of magical, then you get to tell this story to other people. And you get to give those customers, those community members, credit for that idea. And you can keep going through this cycle. And you keep doing that until you stop counting. And your product will have improved dramatically. And the community will love you because of the ROI they got on their investment of ideas and feedback. Yeah, I think another big part of how we developed our reputation within the space was uh, really how what our approach to managing what was in our control. And that's what I mean by, or what we mean rather by show up every day. Uh, it sign, sounds kind of cliche and just like not specific, but like we've just experienced so many magical things just, just by showing up every day and also the fact that like our competition just does not <laughs> so we just saw it as a way of like showing our passion about the problems we're solving and how we solve customers like taking that opportunity any way that we can because it's really easy to show up when customers are happy but when showing up actually matters the most we found is is when they're unhappy so kind of like what zach was talking about was that we found that those are the opportunities to build the most positive reputation by figuring out to make it uh, right. And excuse me, those people that um, were our biggest critics, we've time and time again, turned them into uh, our biggest fans. And so we've kind of almost seen it as like somewhat of a repeatable process. But over time, we believe this mindset of showing up uh, over time yields similar benefits as like compound interest. And that investment over time, money, and going wherever necessary built up a si significant amount of social equity that we believe really contribute contributed to our final chapter. And what's that final chapter? Yeah, so a bit of a bit of a drum roll here, please. All right, and there we go. All right, it's <laughs> luck. So, to be honest, there's in our opinion, no getting around the fact that our growth was significantly impacted by some strange fortune. Uh, several people in our network, whether they were advisors or customers or just like other founders, investors, 
they would always talk about startups having some sort of inflection point or moment when, you know, they just had, it, it just things change for them. Uh, and so we would just always wonder, well, when's our time coming? It seems like things are going good. We're hitting 10 K MRR, continuing to grow. It's going good, but it's, it's not like we're not, nothing's gone viral yet, if you will. Um, and so we're just one of those many stories of a crazy opportunity uh, and shelter in place was ours. So suddenly uh, content creators across the world were in desperate need of a high quality remote solution to keep their production on schedule. And thankfully Squadcast had already built up this reputation as being really focused on uh, recording quality content remotely. Um, so I don't know if you remember, man, but like back in March, uh, getting on the phone and just being like, holy F word, is this, is this happening? Is this, is this it? And then what were yeah, you saying? This is it. This yeah, is, I think it is. So uh, a <laughs> little crazy and, and not lost on us that like we are fortunate and, and, but uh, I don't think our story is necessarily that exceptional because there's other people that are benefiting and, and having success in this as, as well. Um, but Anthony Bourdain, who we're a big fan of, and I know he's not a startup founder, so I have no idea what the context of this quote was in, but he uh, was quoted as saying, luck is not a business model. And we agree with him. So, But we believe our luck was only realized uh, because we were so focused on being the best at something that mattered and had built up a reputation uh, for when our time come came. Yeah. And uh, about luck, you know, as, as far as we know, uh, in, inflections, inflection points, they can't really be designed or engineered. Uh, side note, if you feel otherwise, we're, we're happy to explore that. Um, but what you can design and engineer is in preparation for those inflection points to come. So um, why did we sponsor the largest conference in our industry before we even had a stable product or any customers? Uh, why did we need to build a global cloud infrastructure with microservices built to scale when we only had like 50 customers? So much of the work that we did before shelter in place felt like extreme overkill. But in reality, uh, it wasn't um, because we were ready for when luck found us. So look at where you are each day and ask yourself, what would break if we were to 10x tomorrow? Like uh, I was just talking with my wife over the weekend and it's like, are, are you ready to explode? You know, uh, that's, that's a strange question, but that's essentially another way to say it. So make those improvements now. Uh, ask yourself that question, make a list, do those improvements, keep repeating that. And take your startup seriously. I, I know you all do, but take it more seriously. <laughs> and uh, have intentions to grow it, be, be ready to explode. So what are you doing all of this hard work for if, if you're not expecting that growth is even another way to put it. All right, so the big question is, is what now? Well, I mean, we're certainly not done yet as, as proud as we are of, of our accomplishments in many ways we still feel like we're just getting started and yeah. there's so many <laughs> things left to accomplish which i guess is the beauty and the beast of of this whole game that we're in uh but we have learned that what got us to 10k is not what got us to, to 10, 100k i mean you know think about how different our jobs day to day are from just a couple months ago it's it's continuing to evolve and change and Very. something i think we're learning to embrace and really uh get excited about even though uh you know, change isn't always the easiest thing to deal with. Uh, but we do feel like the same is going to be true for when we hit that 1 million MRR amount or uh, beyond. Yeah, and we have some really good ideas. We built up and are continuing to build a really great team uh, to prepare for that tomorrow, today. And um, if, if we, if we, if we would not be able to get there without focus, reputation, and luck to this next milestone beyond where we're headed. So thank you all so much for, for listening to us today and making this event really great. Uh, we, we've had a great time learning from everybody, and we hope the same is true for you. True for you. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, just a reminder to folks in Shindig, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. It looks like, looks like we have quite a few questions already pouring in. Um, 
Great. I'm going to kick us off with first question. Did you guys ever launch that sci-fi audio drama? <laughs> Tell them. Um, yeah, not yet. Yeah, not uh, yet. We, do have, uh, we do have a podcast, though, called Between Two Mics, where we explore the and have conversations with people that are helping to advance podcasting forward in different ways. Uh, audio dramas, science fiction are, uh, are a big part of that, but we also talk about the technology and just uh, general momentum. Podcasting being a relatively new medium has all sorts of opportunities for, for innovation. And some of that science fiction is, is becoming science fact. So we're, we're proud to play a small part in that. Very cool. If you ever launch it, I, I want to check it out. So yeah, first question. We got one subscriber. Yeah, and we have uh, we've totally. made up more connections and friends who are actually. Turns out podcasts like that are a tremendous amount of work. I mean, you know, Rob, with uh, with your media production, uh, an interview podcast is uh, is a lot of work. But uh, scripted drama with voice actors all over the world, yeah. But uh, thankfully, our technology solution is there to uh, to keep the quality up. Indeed. So first question from the audience: Deep asks. Zach, without any previous references of success, how did you stay on a path to solid growth? Did you put your eyes on 100K MRR or was it more wing it, more, more a wing it playful approach to see how far you got? And then he has a separate question for Rock, but I feel like either of you could answer that. Yeah, these, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, I, I would not say it was wing it. I would say that it's, uh, you know, milestone, uh, reassess, <laughs> mile, you know, reach a milestone reassess what's next what's what do we think is it going to take to get us there what are kind of the bottlenecks to that today what's our path to remove those and also then um like what are the resources we have now because that's another thing that's evolving it's not just a new set of challenges it's a new set of opportunities that come from your new mrr having reached that you can use those resources to add invest further into your business further into the community and just continue uh, continuing that cycle, I think is more so how we look at it. It's just that there's more zeros now. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a trip, but that that's our process. And if I could just add, it's kind of similar to the advice we give to podcasters that have interview shows where they ask like, should I have like a script of all these detailed questions I want, or is it better to wing it? What, what do you think is best? And what we found is somewhere in the middle, having an outline of where you want to go, some type of roadmap, if you will, but leaving yourself freedom for things to come up, some creativity, like you never know what's, what's going to happen. Like we didn't know shelter in place would just put us in a position where we had to handle just a surge of, of new podcasters or experienced podcasters that need to record their shows remotely. Yeah. I like to think of it because when I record a podcast interview, I do have an outline of questions I'm going to ask, but I almost never stick to that outline. I also, uh, I'll either skip some or I'll insert additional ones, uh, you know, based on what someone says. I like to think of it as if I'm going to drive from LA to New York, I know that I'm going East. I don't know if I'm going the South route or the North route, or there's all these different places I could go through, but in general, I know where I'm going. And then it, you just don't know how fast you're going to go and exactly what roads you're going to take. Right. I think that's a, a decent metaphor for it. Yeah. Totally. Um, next question from deep. Um, he addressed it to rock, but again, I feel like either you could ask it. He said, rock, you mentioned learning from the greats plus just in time learning. Can you elaborate on that? What specifically worked really well for you with regards to learnings with regard to learnings? Yeah. So when we first started Squadcast, we didn't really know what we were becoming a part of in the sense of a community. We didn't know like bootstrapping was this whole thing. And we didn't know any podcasters. Well, like... that, that too. <laughs> yeah. So we just would go to wherever those people were that were either, you know, experienced SaaS founders like, like you, Rob, Dan Martell, or, you know, some of the more specific stuff like uh, Patrick Campbell from ProfitWell. They do a bunch of stuff on pricing. So when we needed to learn pricing just in time, we went to the people who were seen as experts. And again, the easy part is, is learning. The hard part is implementing. Um, and, but we just are, we, I feel like we're a testament of it's worth that effort because it did transform our business. It, it's also a, a bit meta. We use pod, I mentioned in the very beginning that we love learning from podcasts because it's a very efficient way to go deep on a very niche topic. So you want to learn about SaaS pricing, right? Uh, you can find, you know, three podcast episodes, 10 podcast episodes on that and be from zero to 60 by like later today, uh, listening to those. And like Rock said, the trick really is having the levers, being able to implement that right away. So um, I can't, uh, there, there's so many examples of 
oh, I just read this book or I just read this chapter or this section of this book. And, you know, it's it's part of our business and strategy the next day. Um, that's something that we repeat over and over and over again. Yep. It's that advantage of being a startup founder and being able to implement really quickly, right? Versus working at a Fortune 500 or 1,000. And you're, it might take you three months to get everyone on board and, like, get, you know, get a pilot project going. I'm not saying it's bad to work at Fortune 1000. It's just the different trade-offs we have, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and Tiny Seed is some extreme version of that. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we've picked up, uh, we've picked up so much and implemented it very quickly, and we're seeing that same, uh, same approach from our peer company. So that that's a great way to kind of throw some gasoline on the fire with advice sure. and you know, all the great things that come from the work that they're doing. Yeah, and that, that brings us to our next question. It's a good segue. So Justin Jackson asked, why take funding from Tiny Seed if you are at 100K MRR? Well, that's a great question, Justin. Uh, <laughs> so we were not at 100K by the time we started talking to Tiny Seed. Uh, it just kind of happened, but we were already uh, looking for ways to um, just grow our network and become more professional <laughs> founders. After talking with so many different investors, angels, accelerators, Tiny C just felt like the right fit for uh, many reasons. Um, but yeah, shortly after um, that relationship became formalized, we did hit 100K. So the money was not something we really necessarily needed, but the the advice and the, the support is something that uh, we truly value, especially as we're navigating these waters for the first time. That's something we've always tried to... Um tried to remain mindful of is uh, when you're not going out and actively raising venture capital, we, we tend to think of it exactly like that, where it's, it's, it's capital. Um, but you're also kind of uh, potentially sacrificing opportunities to get advice from people who have done this before. And so we've always been very intentional about our advisory board and the, the skills within um, so that we can, we can learn from people who have done this before as first time founders. And then tiny seed again, was just a, a crazy, crazy degree of that same approach that, um, has already been having a really great impact, uh, beyond kind of our, our core advisory board. Yeah. I think, I think that's an important point and tiny seed aside, it's like a mistake I made early on. And I think a lot of bootstrappers make is that they feel like they should be able to do it all on their own and they don't set up an advisory board or they don't have a mastermind group or they don't have other people who have true kind of insight and impact on into their business. And, and you guys have done a good job. There's some people that I know, like Ruben Gama is another example of someone who has really always sought out mentors and is just willing to be teachable, you know, is willing to, to not have the attitude. Again, the attitude I had 10 years ago of like, well, I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to do it all on my own. And it just, it, it took me a lot longer to get there because of that. So I think advice network and, and the bat, you know, being in a community and having a mastermind, I think all that's like so, so important. So, uh, Eric Tompkins asks, can you talk more about how you invest in the podcast community? Where and how can this be done? Yeah. So, uh, just the re most recent example, we, uh, we, funded or we provide this we provided the seed funding for the we are diverse creators summit which is um was a remote event for by uh founded by one of our advisors uh adriana flores regard uh co-founded this new event that was an underserved conversation and community within podcasting and um, i'm very grateful that we could help bring that to life uh through some through some investment and also participation. So it's not all dollars and you know capital. It's also Rock spoke at that event. Um, and we we helped kind of provide a, our network for getting speakers to that event. And there's all sorts of ways that you can leverage the resources that you have. That may not always be capital uh, to invest. It's social equity, it's your network, it's it's these um, these additional elements that you can bring to uh, to the community. So we speak at events all the time. That's another great way. Of course, we we sponsor events um, and continue continue on that path. I mean, of course, shelter in place has kind of turned that on its head as we're all experiencing right now. So uh, I respect what you're doing uh, with with the team, Rob, of, of finding a way to make this engaging and, and stay stay the course, even though uh, 2020 has been so strange. So, uh, so there are all sorts of ways. Another is just um, talking to our customers, talking to the community and not having kind of a sales agenda, just listening, right? Um, it, through meetups and, and in our case, we uh, have 
we have the ability to go on and be guests on people's podcasts and learn from them about what they're doing, um, how they're interviewing other people, what they're learning from their guests. So there's there's all sorts of ways. Um, I would just even, it's, it's probably helpful to just even, not even worry about the money as an investment, find other resources that you have and uh, and put those to work in the community. Very cool. So we have, we're going to have the lightning round here. We have about three and a half minutes and I think I have like another six questions or something. So a question from Andrew Comfort. He says, you have pending patents and perhaps more in the works. How do you balance your intellectual property secrecy slash NDA needs with your openness and communication and acceptance of ideas from users? Ooh, I thought that was going to take a different turn. I thought he was going to talk about when you file patents, they're public and competitors can copy them. So, but he's saying user. Global. We only filed patents in the U.S. So that's a whole different, uh, you know, consideration. But um, you're absolutely right. We are open with our customers. Uh, it's just the level of detail that we provide. And um, one of those patents anyway is how, how we upload and um, progressively upload our audio so that it's uh, reliable as well as high quality. And that idea came from one of our, from our founding advisor, Harry Duran, who... Uh, you want to listen to our podcast, the episode just dropped today with a conversation with him. That's called Between Two Mics. So uh, Harry gets full credit for that idea of progressive upload. Well, not full credit. Well, yeah. How we actually built it, very, <laughs> very different thing. It took us 10 attempts, right, to build this out. So um, there's, uh, it's just a level of transparency that, that you provide. You, we can talk about how things work without getting into the nitty gritty, nitty gritty of how this particular microservice sends this request and routes, you know, <laughs> how we render that audio or there's all sorts of details there that that actually inform the patent of being novel that uh, you don't need to put in your marketing material. It's just more so communicating the benefits of it. Question from James McBrien. Since you grew a lot during shelter in place, do you expect do you expect the post shelter in place world to impact your company? How are you preparing for that? Yeah, so I'll answer this as best I can with lightning round response. Uh, of course, we definitely anticipate some sort of change. However, our main focus is to just make sure that the relationships we're building now continue to stay intact and sticky. And what we're learning, uh, because we're so intimately involved with all of our customers, whether it's solo podcasters or uh, Vox, ESPN, the folks over there that we're talking to, it does sound like there's going to be a place for remote recording in their production, that they see the benefits of it. A lot of these companies or people uh, aren't all in the same room. So they're still going to, we think that we're confident that there's still going to be a place for for squadcasting these production schedules uh, for, for the near future, or yeah. not near future. Long, long ESPN long. is a great example. They're a distributed company because of their scale. So there's absolutely, there was a place before, there's a place after. Now it's just more so like, hey, we don't have to sacrifice quality to uh, to record remotely. We're trying to do that. Uh, <laughs> trying to do that. Come on, man. So last question for the day from Justin Jackson. How big is the Squadcast team? Yeah, so we're, uh, we're up to seven as of last week. So we just added a, a new a new uh, software engineer and product manager, Grace. Thank you. And, uh, and she's already crushing it um, up and running. And then uh, as of last week, a uh, voice, very strong voice within our community, we hired as a community manager and her name is Ariel Nissenblatt. So we're very excited with the growth of the team. Uh, the, the five uh, in addition to that were kind of Rock and I and our founding team. So, uh, you know, that's, that's where we're at right now. Gentlemen, thank you so much again, Rock and Zach. Appreciate your time today on MicroConf Remote. Hey everyone. Hello, hello. Okay, my name is Asia and I am the CEO and founder of Demand Maven. And the question is, what's a quick fix that you can implement now in order to make your business way easier to run in the future? And hands down, I have to say, it's paying off your analytics debt today right now, if you possibly can. What is analytics debt? Well, it's actually based off of a term that uh, you might actually already know, especially if you're a technical founder or a co-founder. Uh, you might have heard of technical debt or code debt, which basically just means as you implement certain parts of your product, there's going to be certain parts of the code base and even just certain investments technology-wise that over time prevent you from growing in some kind of way. It could also just be impacting overall operations, the code base isn't as efficient, especially as the product and the business grows and matures, especially so as you start making certain decisions about how certain features are implemented, how certain things are coded, and also how certain parts of the platform, again, 
are implemented, you over time just naturally incur this technical debt. You'll have to naturally start making decisions about if you tackle rebuilding certain parts of your product or even uh, replacing certain technologies and also what's just kind of okay to kind of turn a blind eye to for now, but knowing that you'll get to it and fix it or replace it in the next six months could even be up to several years. And not all technical debt is necessarily bad debt. You naturally incur it. It's really up to you, the founders, the engineering team, and then of course the product team to decide what makes more sense to tackle now versus later. But as long as you are aware of the choices that you make and also the choices that you don't make, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what technical debt is all about. And analytics debt is the same exact concept, except it's applied specifically to your analytics. It might sound really shocking, but there's actually businesses out there right now today who have reached 20K in MRR or 50K in MRR, and they have no idea what the top channels are that contribute to overall marketing growth or just overall acquisition. They have no idea what the top features are that someone needs to execute in order to most likely become a paying customer. There's, there's so much from acquisition to activation to retention that is relatively unknown. And part of this is because there's no overall... Uh, analytics strategy or plan in order to really figure out how to measure the ultimate things that you need to measure in order to make good decisions. And on top of that, the interesting part about analytics debt is that it really starts from day one. It really starts from day one, building the product, and then of course, launching it, going to market with the product and deciding what are the features and just customer segments that we need to be able to measure and what, how do certain cohorts over time perform. And analytics debt is, uh, it's extremely common. And I work with early stage SaaS companies on reaching those very first growth milestones. And I've got to say, it's an extremely common thing. It's very normal. If you are experiencing analytics debt in any kind of way right now, let me just say that it's absolutely normal, but I will also encourage you to pay it off now if you can. You don't want to get to 15K MRR or even 30K MRR, honestly, even 10K MRR and have zero idea about where those customers came from, how they found you. And the cool part about uh, analytics debt is that you can technically start now with really simple really simple tools, uh, even free tools. So Google Analytics is probably one of the most common analytics tools that you can use to measure overall marketing performance. So how does the website perform? How does certain channels perform? What, what, what is the overall behavior just from traffic? It could also just be demos if you're more of a demo model versus a free trial model. How does overall marketing perform? And then you can also get into much more complex platforms over time, like uh, Full Story or Amplitude or Mixed Panel Heap, and start looking more at product specific analytics. So, how do certain cohorts behave in the product? How do certain customer segments uh, convert in the product based off of where you've acquired them from? And also, what are just the most important behaviors to become a paying customer? These are questions that you don't want to go too long not knowing the answer to. It's so critical to pay it off. Now now, if you can, because the interest can actually set you back entire years, especially if you get to a certain growth point, growth gets stagnant. And again, you have no idea how to troubleshoot it. You have no idea where everything comes from. There's really three kinds of analytics debt that I've identified. Uh, and, and there's, I'm sure there's certainly more, but the most common ones hands down are uh, product analytics, marketing analytics, and of course, business analytics. Product analytics, I mentioned a few platforms already, but you can look at things like, uh, uh, even uh, user list. There's also mixed panel amplitude. And then of course there's marketing analytics. Some of the most common platforms have to do more with attribution. And then of course, just overall website performance, Google analytics, I would say is extremely common to start with. And then layering on complexity over time using tools like maybe a HubSpot or um, it really just depends of course on your business from there. And then lastly, there's business analytics, just very simple qu uh, metrics and KPIs like lifetime value or average revenue per user. Uh, how long does a particular cohort stay with you of customers? And what is the overall retention after six months, 12 months, being able to answer those questions with like a subscription metrics platform, something like ProfitWell or Bear Metrics or ChartMogul. And uh, again, like this, this tackles more, maybe more of the subscription side. 
And then at the end of the day, especially if you uh, are technical, you can of course leverage your own database of information to pull whatever number of reports you need to pull. But just make sure that you actually can and make sure also that you have a plan for thinking about what are some of the unknowns in your business today and then start figuring out like what are the tasks that we need to uh, define so that we can start tackling that. This is my quick fix. I really hope that that was helpful. Pay off your analytics debt now if you can. You, again, you, just, you don't want to get too long or, or too far into your growth process not knowing certain answers. So if you can tackle them now, do it. If you have the means to, do it. And you don't have to be com super complex from day one. Like I said, you can use something simple like Google Analytics and then layer on complexity over time. But you really want to be able to answer some of those fundamental questions. Thanks again. Have a good one. Now here in the studio, once again, socially distancing. <laughs> it feels like you're so far away. I have Nate Grahak. He is a uh, St. Paul local. Yes. So it's amazing to have you join me here in person, even during these non-travel uh, COVID times. So Nate actually is the, the focus of the most downloaded Startups for the Rest of Us episode ever. And I believe, I mean, it's probably 200 episodes ago, but it's how a non-technical founder built a seven-figure SaaS app, if I recall. Some Sounds like right. That. Yep. So Nate is uh, the founder of Sticky Albums, and he founded that in 2012. He's a former portrait photographer and a corporate trainer, and he loves anything radio controlled. Is that like cars <laughs> and airplanes? It is, yeah. It's cool. Yes. Uh, so he and I are going to dive into a topic that I think inspires both fear and perhaps some aspiration in many bootstrap founders. It's the ability to delegate responsibilities to your team so that they can get the job done without you hovering over them. So I think you have some email rules or tips for yeah. empowering your team. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. Just driving in, A, that's weird. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> reflecting on uh, the last nine years of running my business, listening to the story of Squadcast just really brought me back to how grateful I am for this community you've created. So it's an honor to be here to give back and even a little bit uh, Thinking back, I grew to a million in ARR in two years. So that really relating to that all of a sudden, where's my life? What kind of balance, semblance? I had two new kids and I learned these lessons haphazardly. Yep, yep. <laughs> so uh, I think the first thing I learned is the right type of communication has to happen in the right channels. So right now let's just talk about email. And I think that for, for as much love as Slack gets, I still think there's some good things about email, even internally, instead of just interrupting each other all the time. So number one, um, I set these rules with my team. Uh, you want to get a quick response from me, it has to pass the yes test. What I mean by that is in, for any of you, if you want to send this, uh, try to get attention to somebody, a VIP, or just to give these rules to your new team or new and growing team, uh, make sure that when they send an email, it passes a yes test. Meaning, if we can all use our imagination. How great is it in Gmail? I think this is a labs feature where it gives you those three suggestion buttons. <laughs> God, I love those. <laughs> I love hitting, yep, that's perfect. Yeah. And it's done. Guess what? Those emails get replied to first. So I want, walk through these three rules. Number one, give me a good, useful subject line. Uh, don't use the word urgent, because if it's urgent, uh, it shouldn't be an email. <laughs> Number two, give me what you recommend. And even though we typically will give the whole context, give the story of the issue, uh, what's happening, and then we'll wrap up with a recommendation, I tell my team to put that at the top. So I can just glance it, I know what is you're gonna try to do, or what you recommend, and then if I need to, I can scan down to the, recommend, the needed context. And that's the third element. And so I say, give me screenshots. Don't, don't uh, assume that I'm on my phone, I'm I, on vacation maybe, uh, I don't have time to log into which Facebook group something's happening in or which system, just take a screenshot and put it in the email and it's there if I need it. And then I can respond with, yep, that's awesome. Um, I'll also walk them through, uh, Give me, so make sure you don't put in too many to-dos. This is a big one. For a while, uh, my team thought they were being helpful by giving me like the summary. But for a lot of us still, for better or worse, our inbox is our to-do list in some ways. And so what was happening is if I had an email with five things I had to do, they'd have to sit there until I got all five of them done. 
Instead, if you just break it up into five emails, I can knock those out really quickly. So for those of you watching, the tricky part here is how do we deliver this message? How do I get my team to follow these rules, right? Yep. Um, so I think the biggest one is just to be, to use some, some humor, some humility, and apologize when um, having a one-on-one -on -one and going, you know what, look, I'm really sorry, I owed you these emails or uh, I should have got back to you sooner. This is what, uh, if we follow this, this set of rules, it'll help me empower you to continue to do the work. And I think that's, the, that's probably the bigger point here is like just really learning how to delegate, right? Yep. Um, I think that it's fun for a while when you're in the weeds, you get to do everything. But the more I would, if I, let's just take an example of a bad email. Hey, Nate, uh, so-and-so said something on Facebook. What should I do about it? I don't know which, which, where on Facebook, who, like what's the history, what's the context, that, then I'll, I would just go do it because it, it felt urgent to me and I'd want to go just solve it. But I was conditioning my team to just give me alerts. They weren't actually doing and solving it themselves. So when I switched to this, this system, it really empowered them to do the work. And it feels so good to be, there's, I think uh, you, you and Sherry talk a lot about the value of vacation and, and taking a breather. And it's such a good stress test for your business and for your team to step away. And I personally take such pride in being able to see the team handle it and me just say, you got it. And it empowers them the next time they know what to do and it just starts to snowball in the right direction. Right, very cool. It reminds me of, um, you know, the kind of the managerial adage of, of bring problems, not solutions. Yeah. And that's in essence what you're saying is you're trying to level people up. Look, I remember being, I was right out of college. I was 21 years old, I think. And I got a job as a project manager. And I would, I wasn't even a project. I was a project coordinator or something, which is like below it. And I'd go to the project managers and I'd say, oh my gosh, I, uh, there's something wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I didn't know what to do. And, and so it took me a few years to learn. Oh, start thinking... I started learning from what these project managers would, would tell me, and I was realizing, oh, here's they're they're thinking about it in a systematic way, right. and they're and they would give me a few you know solutions, and I would go back and implement one, and I realized why can't I start doing that? I'm a smart person, right? And so that's what you're doing. You're like leveling up your own team with this. Yep, right? and it's it's real. It's I think it's a double-edged sword. You have to really trust and be okay that your team can do it at least eighty to ninety percent as good as you can. It's yeah. always going to be different, but being able to see their thought process. The other thing is, think about, and this is a message you can deliver to your team too when, when implementing this. Say, look, um, let's just pretend I'm your, uh, your diving coach. I can only help you so much talking about it or me showing, me doing the dive and showing you what to do. But where the real growth comes is when you just get up and start jumping off the diving board. Then, so th that's, th the connection here is when your team starts giving you their recommendation. That's the big mm. risk, right? When yep. they say, I recommend we should do this. Yep. They're, at first, they're going to be insecure about it. So you have to be gentle about what critiques you give yep. and say, look, this is, you did great here. Here's a slight thing to add. Make sure you copy this person or let's do this too, but awesome recommendation. So that conditions them to continue wanting to do it and empowering them to, to really do their job without you. Yep. But it's at the end of the day what we really want. So, so what were the rules again? Were Number one, you need a useful subject line. Okay. Number two, add, uh, make sure they include what they recommend. Yep. Number three, there any retired, required context with screenshots instead of links to things. Got it. Um, yes. Why not links? What do, what do links do? What, how do links make things more complicated for you? Um, it, it breaks the yes test. So uh, I tell people, there's, here's the, the tricky part to walk is, uh, I want people to know, I want them to pretend like I'm on vacation almost, right? Yeah. And you have to be delicate delivering that message, but you bring it back to what they want. They want growth. They want to stay productive. They want to show you that they can handle it. And so you focus on those things. Um, that's why I don't want links is because I am on my phone and I don't, ha I don't have the password or it look, it's not a mobile friendly, if there are any of those still. <laughs> a, a mobile, it's like a really bad interface that I don't want to go digging in. Just give me the screenshot, because I don't really need to know all of it. I can just scan and see it with a screenshot. Right, and that's the thing. I mean, this may sound crazy if 
if you're a team of two people or a team of three people, but you, you get to where you're managing six, eight, ten people, right. and suddenly this is a big issue because even if you're not on your phone, you just can't respond. You can't solve everyone's problems all the time, right? Exactly. You should be getting yourself as a manager or a CEO or a founder into a position where only the, fi the real bad fires are coming up to you. Exactly. And that, it's, that can be tough because then all, your whole day is just fighting really bad fires, and I've been there. <laughs> but um, but if it, you know, the better you make your team, the more they can, they can handle these. So, okay, so you talked a little bit about like the beauty of doing it so you can go on vacation and kind of have more freedom or, or get more done. Are there any other, like, in your experience, why did you need to make these rules? Any other reasons beyond that? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a, like a bonus concept in here because it's one of my favorite analogies, I think, that I have. So we had a, a very agile team of like three people in product and two or three people in support, and we were all on a two-week on-hands dev call. That was our best two-week call, and I, I wanted to eliminate all of the direct interruptions. I really think it's so important to protect people's uninterrupted time. And I said, we need to pretend like the developers are on a ship with no communication. They're coming into port for one, one meeting. We get to load them up with everything we need them to do. Because for the first couple years, I was constantly changing my mind. I was the biggest offender, right? This is, these rules were for me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, nope, we're gonna define these objectives for these two weeks. We're not gonna shift course because that's where we lose so much, not just productivity, but mental health. And people just don't, they get burned out when you're constantly redirecting them. Yep. Uh, so I said, we can't add to-dos to them uh, during that, the sprint. Once they're gone, they go out to port, guess what? Their phones will work back to us for emergencies, for like, hey, wait, what's the clarification on this thing? And then we can connect and really quick solve it, but we're not gonna change to-dos, we're not gonna change priorities on what they're building this, for this sprint. And that was really helpful also. Yeah, very cool. So I'm curious, you have, you know, what they should always make a recommendation. What yeah. about an issue that is, is perhaps so complex or yep. so challenging, or someone's like, ah, I think there's like one of four things, maybe it's almost kind of needs a whiteboard or brainstorming sessions. What about those issues? What should they do with them? Yeah, I think that comes down to this uh, one extra rule is making, is coaching your team to use, communicate the right message in the right channel. And I made this mistake as an employee too, where in a one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's, I, I, I love doing them, I love being, you finally get the, the boss's attention. I really enjoyed the one-on-one -on -one time. I would dread it leading up to it because it meant I'd have to stop what I was doing, but like, I really did enjoy developing my team. Um, so, but when they're there, there's that connection that I think a lot of rookie employees will take that same energy and tone of the meeting and they'll try to keep talking to me that way over Slack, right. and it's like, what? no, that does not gonna work. Like, and I think naming it, you just gotta name it. Like, look, this is our time to do this. Mm -hmm. So I would, on our, we would use Trello where they could keep kind of a, an inbox for themselves of things that they wanted to talk to me about during their one-on-one. -on -one. Yep. That way they weren't just, hey, Nate, I have this idea. Yeah, that's a re and that's a real danger of Slack. Yep. Um, I, kind of the rules that I've made with my teams over the years since Slack came around is, if you need something, if something is truly urgent and is blocking you and you need an answer in the next 20 minutes, then slack me. Yep. But if you can wait, uh, I don't know, two to four hours, then email me. And yep. frankly, I'm faster than that. If they give me email like this, I'm way faster than right. that. Right. And then, um, I don't even remember what, overnight is, I don't know, carrier pigeon or something, but <laughs> okay, cool. So as we wrap up, we have a couple minutes left. Um, Obviously, this can be a big change for folks, and, and you can coach them into it, but are there other ways to, to implement this? How would you advise that you know, a founder listening to this roll this out? Yeah, so I put together this morning, because I was like, huh, this is good for you guys to know you want, but I put together a quick training, uh, literally like before I came in this morning, and I'm gonna share it in the Slack group. I'll give it to Xander, he'll post a, a quick 10 minute training, and I delivered this same content, but direct as if it's a training for your team to watch. So you could just share the link and say, Hey guys, I, what do you think about this new strategy to help us, to help me uh, give you answers faster? Um, but I think the bigger thing is just having humility. Let's say apologizing. I think some of the best things I did as a leader is apologize when I made a mistake. Like, look guys, I'm new at this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I, I, I dropped the ball here. Um, I, it was, 
I, I, stopped, I tried to get too much in the weeds and I, cause I like it, but you know what? I hired you for a reason. You're super talented at what you do. You should just go do it. Uh, and so to, these rules are as much for me getting out of your way as they are for you to be productive and really enjoy your job. I think that's a really important way to think about it too. So we will get those into Shindig. We'll get it to producer Xander as well as the MicroConf Connect Slack. Awesome. Nate Grahak, thank you so much, sir. It's thanks. an honor to be here, man. Thanks, thanks. so much. Thanks. Just, thanks for all of the investment and the time and energy to this community. I know this is weirdly remote, but man, what this is such an honor to be here. And I, I, it's so cool to see you still making an effort to bring what can be like lonely as entrepreneurs. I think this is really important that we're doing this. So thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks, sir. So our, our next guest um, is the co-founder of Hey, Hey.com. And so um, Hey is a, a headline sponsor, headline partner of MicroConf and Startups for the Rest of Us um, in 2020. And they've been a great supporter of ours uh, for the past several years. And you know, our next guest, Jason Free, joined me on stage last year at MicroConf Growth. We had a really good uh, Q&A session and conversation where he answered questions about early days of Basecamp. He took questions from the audience and was just very gracious um, with his time and, and we really appreciated it. And, uh, you know, Hay has launched this year. This is the new product coming out of Basecamp. Um, and Hay has been, as I said, you know, uh, a sponsor and they've come alongside to, to try to help this bootstrapped indie funded community and, and help us be able to provide events like this to you because these types of events, we'd have to charge a lot more for them if we didn't have sponsors like Hay. Um, so I'd love it if you'd give a shout out to Hay on Twitter and just thank them for supporting this bootstrapped community. And with that, I'd love to welcome Jason Freed, the co-founder of Basecamp to the show. Um, you know, obviously he's one of the original badass bootstrappers that has consistently provided guidance and good advice to founders for going on two decades now. Several books written with his co-founder DHH and obviously an outlier that's, you know, taken a stair-step approach to the very top, started building new steps to take their companies to new heights. It's like he, he added many zeros to the, to the formula that I think most of us uh, ascribe to. So this is an AMA, an Ask Him Anything. Jason's here to answer all your questions about what it was like to build Hay, how the successes of Basecamp served as a basis for the launch of Hay, and really anything you'd like to ask him about that. I also have a, a few questions um, to, to kick us off, but you can just use the question button in Shindig, and it's, it's down below you, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. My guess is, based on how these things normally go with Jason, there will be more questions that we can possibly answer, but we have about, um, we're just under 30 minutes now to roll in. So Jason, sir, thank you so much for sharing the stage with me again. No, it's great to be uh, here. Thanks for having me back. back. Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome to see you again. Are you, uh, are you in Chicago or California? I'm currently in California, California. Yeah, okay. but, but primarily living in, in Chicago. Based in Chicago, yeah. It's nice and sunny outside there, so I was thinking you might be on, on a coast there somewhere. So for, for folks who don't know, so anyone can email me robwalling at hey.com if you want to uh, hit my hey inbox. Um, but hey is an email service that doesn't, you know, so I want to I set the stage, right? There's Gmail and then Superhuman launched a few years ago and Superhuman is built on top of Gmail. So you need a Gmail or Google Apps account to use it. Hey is not that. Hey is, is next to Gmail. Like you have bare bones servers, SMTP, Top three, all that stuff, right? It's a, it, you have you have the entire infrastructure in place. Yeah, hey, hey is an email service. So just like when you sign up for Gmail, you get a gmail.com address. If you sign up for hey, you get a hey.com, h e y dot com. So we are a provider. You don't need to use Google. You don't need to use Outlook. You don't need to use Apple iCloud. You don't need to use any other email provider. And um, the reason we did that is because we wanted to innovate. We wanted to make new something new. And if you're riding on top of someone else's platform. Like most email clients sit on top of Gmail or whatever SMTP provider, you, you, there's not a lot you can really do because you're beholden to how they do things. So if you want to do something new, you've got to start from the ground up. Um, you've got to be vertically integrated in that way. And uh, that's where you can really make some changes. And, you know, so obviously, I mean, Basecamp is, is an amazing success story, but you know, compare, let's compare your revenue to Google, Microsoft, Apple, these other companies you're competing with. It, it's, there's, there's a lot of zeros difference there. So why, why did you <laughs> a think lot. That, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, what, I guess, you know, what is in your DNA, you know, the DNA of Basecamp that, that convinced you guys that, Hey, we can take on these, these bigger players. Well, for one, I mean, yeah, technically we're taking them on because a lot of our customers 
have switched over um, from from Gmail for primarily from Gmail over to Hey. So technically, yes, we're competing, but not really. And, and what I mean by that is, I think Gmail has 1.5 billion email accounts on, on Gmail. We're not going to have that. <laughs> we're not looking for that. We're not even in that realm, and we don't want to be. You know, um, we're a paid service, so we're not giving email away for free. And just like with Basecamp, you know, we have, if we get 100,000 paid customers, we're in a pretty good position. So that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for people who really care about email, who are frustrated to no end with it, looking for something new, looking for something that's private, looking for something that's not going to mine your data, and looking at it, something that has built-in workflows and not workarounds. And so if we get 100,000, 200,000 of those kinds of people, we're, we're in a good place. So we don't need to match Google or Outlook or, or, or Yahoo. Different game, although we're playing the same by the, some of the same rules and that we're a service provider like they are, but, but our, our approach is very different. So, yeah, I mean, it's the stupidest thing we've ever done, and I mean that in the most you know, appealing way. Um, but we're also not really trying to – like for us, we're not going to look and go like we didn't, we didn't get – you know, we didn't beat Gmail, so we lost. Like, that's just not how we look at things in general. Yeah, that makes a lot Here's of sense. Here's the other thing I want to say about this is that companies have their own economics. And this is something you don't hear enough about, in my opinion, which is that people are like, well, how do you compete with them? And how do you compete with them? And well, one of the first questions I would ask is like, what are your costs? Because if your costs are a lot less than everyone else's costs, then you can afford to compete in a different level. Like, if we had to get a billion signups to make this thing viable for us, well, then we're probably not going to beat Gmail. But we don't need that. We need tens of thousands or 100,000 or a couple hundred thousand like over a number of years because our cost structure is, is set up completely differently. We don't need that much to cover our costs compared to what Google does, of course, when they have you know, tens of thousands of employees. So you've got to start with that. And then, then you can sort of figure out what makes sense for you. It doesn't, you don't have to do what someone else does you got to do what works for you. And that's really an important thing, I think, for entrepreneurs. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. Thanks for calling that out. You mentioned a couple differentiators. You know, you said we're, you're very privacy focused, uh, workflows, not workarounds. Um, do you want to dive into those two? And maybe if there are any others that are, you know, common talking points about how you are different, why you're different than these other providers? Yeah, for sure. Let's start with privacy. Um, one of the big problems with email, and I'm going to hit it from a couple different angles, but one of the big problems with email, of course, is that you're not in control of who can contact you. It used to be that you'd give out your email address to someone and only that person would have it. And you'd, that was how you kept control over who, who can get in touch with you. But these days, your email address has been bought and sold and traded and posted online. It's, it's everywhere. So we've stopped being in control of who can get in touch with us, which is a problem. If someone calls your cell phone and you don't recognize the number, you just don't pick it up. It's very, there's very little effort just to go, eh, no. With email, anyone who emails you basically lands in your inbox. This is a problem. It's a fundamental problem with email today. So with hey, you get to decide who can email you. The first time somebody emails you, you give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And if they're a thumbs down, you'll never hear from them again. So that's one version of privacy, which is that you are in control of who can get in touch with you. You're in control of who can communicate with you. The other side, of course, is that we, um, we don't sell ads. So we're not mining your data. We're not looking at your data. We're not pulling anything out of your data. Not interesting to us. Don't want to do that ever. And also, we, um, we block trackers. So what a lot of people don't know is these days by simply opening an email with no indication this is the case, if you just open an email, the sender, the person who sent it to you can receive all sorts of personal information about you. How long you read the email, if you opened it, how often you opened it, what kind of phone you have, what brand computer you have, what time it was, your IP address, which they can give, you know, basically get you down to some local information that way as well. We block all that. So if someone tries to include a tracker in an email and you're a hey.com customer, they will not know anything about you. So we're protecting your privacy on that side too. So one, number one is control. Number two is on the back end. We're making sure that nobody learns anything about you, about your behavior. No one tracks you simply by opening an email. Now, that's some of the privacy stuff. There's a bunch of other things as well. But the, the bigger thing though to me is, is the workflow situation. What's amazing to me about email is that email has not evolved for about 16 years. 16 years ago, Gmail came out, and it felt different. It had new ideas in it. The thing is, is that we're still stuck doing the same things we've always done, and no one's really come up with better workflows. For example, simple one. Someone sends you an email, and you need to get back to someone later. Comment. This happens all the time. It's like, yeah, i got to get back to that person later. So what do you do? 
you hack, you hack it. You like mark it on red again. Maybe you star it or flag it. Maybe you, maybe you make a folder or a label and put some stuff in there. Maybe you snooze it. None of those things have anything to do with the mental understanding that I need to get back to someone later. So you're hacking around with workarounds to try to remember that you need to do something later. And you're using all these different things that aren't quite right. So with hey, we actually have a button on every email that says reply later. And when you say reply later, it goes into a nice pile along with all the other emails that you said reply later to. Then you can go into a mode called focus and reply. You click that, it opens up all those emails. It stacks them one on top of the other and lets you simply reply to those one after another without being interrupted or distracted by anything else that's happening. And it's an entirely different way to work on email. And it saves you, it saves me hours a week, which is significant. Um, and it saves me a lot of hassle. And it allows me to say, okay, I've got like 30 minutes now. I'm going to knock out all my emails at the end of the day. I know exactly where they are. Nothing else is going to get in my way. So we've got a dozen or so of those kinds of workflows built into Hay versus workarounds where you're trying to make one thing do something else. So we thought about all that stuff and we were so frustrated by the fact that like email just hasn't changed in so long. It's time to do something new and that's what Hay's all about. Awesome. Yeah. We, have a, we have questions pouring in from the listeners as you would expect. Um, I want to jump down to one producer, Xander, from Brian Yido because it ties into something I was going to ask you about anyways, Jason. His question is, how is Hay's pushback on Apple's App Store terms of service going? And if you wouldn't mind just giving a, you know, a couple sentences or, or one minute description of what happened there with Apple uh, to catch people up and then talk about, you know, has there been a resolution and what that's been? Yeah, of course. Um, so when we launched Hey, we put 1 .0, version 1.0 in the App Store, Apple App Store and Android Store. Both were approved, which was wonderful. And then we, re we, we put a, a 1.0.2 bug release version or update into the App Store and the Apple App Store a few days later, and Apple rejected it. And they rejected it, even though it was nothing materially changed, they rejected it on the grounds that we weren't giving them 30% of our revenue because we were selling a subscription service. And somehow that slipped by the reviewers in the first place is what, what Apple claimed. Um, and so we got in this battle with Apple, basically. Apple said, you have to give us 30% of your revenues. And we said, we're not giving you 30% of our revenues. Um, and they gave us some other things. And this basically kind of blew up in the press. We went to the press over it because it was a strong arm tactic by Apple to extract 30% of our business, which they are not entitled to. Um, the problem is, is that on iOS, of course, everybody knows you don't have choice. So we can't sell, we can't even mention that we can sell our product some other way. We can't mention billing. We can't mention credit cards. We can't mention sign up. Can't mention all these things. And we didn't mention any of those things. Long story short is um, we got into a big public uh, battle with Apple over this. Um, it was all over the press for about a week. And um, we, we didn't give in on terms of the 30%. We're not paying them 30%. But what we did eventually come to terms with, with them over was um, we introduced a slightly, well, a free version uh, of Hey that's available on iOS, which is a slightly different version from our main product. And if you still want to buy Hey, the full version, you still go to hey.com and you buy it there. But at least when you load the app up, there's something that you can sign up for that doesn't require visiting our website. So it turned out that Apple was comfortable with that. We're still not giving them 30% of our revenue, um, but they were comfortable with at least the app doing something on, on launch. Um, but the, the, the bigger thing here is not, there's a few things going on. So there's the 30%, which of course I think is just, you know, uh, usury. It's, it's, it's unfair. It's too, it's too much, first of all. But it's deeper than that, and this is, I think, will resonate with, with people who are, who are watching this, who are entrepreneurs, which is that I do not believe that a company, any company, should be able to tell me how I can service and treat my customers. One of the big unknown things about the App Store is that when, if you use the in-app payment system that Apple requires you to use if you sell products through Apple, is that you cannot provide your customers a certain level of customer service. If you have a billing issue, you have to defer them to Apple. If you want to give them a discount, you can't. If you want to give them half off, you can't. If you want to give them a hardship discount, you can't. For example, when COVID first hit, a lot of our customers on Basecamp wrote us saying, hey, we're small businesses. This is really going to get, take a big hit. This is really hard for us. We said, we'll give you a couple months free. Don't worry about it. Like, we'll help you out. We're here to help you. You can't do that once you've given your customer to Apple because you're not in control of the billing system. So now I have two tiers of customers. I have the customers I can really help the way I want to help them. And I have the customers I have to say, well, you got to go talk to Apple. And by the way, Apple's not going to be able to help you because that's not what the business Apple's in. 
it's not Apple's right to be able to do that to me. They're a one trillion dollar company. Why should they tell me how I can provide service to my customers? It's completely abhorrent to me, and I'm not going to give into that. So that was another big, big angle that we pushed all this forward and out there, and a lot of people started to pay attention and saw that people came out of the woodwork saying, Apple's been doing this to us for years. Apple's been pushing us and bullying us for years. And I think it created a groundswell of, 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 um, uh, of interest and excitement. And then, um, you know, Apple changed the rules at, at WWC the, the following week, um, hopefully influenced a little bit by what we did. And hopefully over time, they'll, they'll change them more and more and more and give developers choice. Uh, I can go into more detail, but I don't want to take over all, all the time. But that's kind of how that happened. Yeah, bravo. Yeah, thank yeah. you, sir. Good explanation. Um, Completely another direction. We have a question from Huang Van, and he says, is Hay using Ruby on the back end? Oh, yes. All of our products are built on, on Rails. Um, so, yep, Hay, Basecamp, High Rise, Campfire, Backpack, everything from this point back forward or, forward, or backwards and forwards is, is built on Rails. There's other technologies we're using as well, but Rails, Rails is, the, is the predominant uh, language behind everything. Yep. Or framework. Cool. Yeah. Um. Ah, I'm trying to figure out if I understand this question. It's from Adrian Fletcher, and it says, what features were Basecamp slash Hey employees really upset to ignore or miss out on in order to launch the service? So I think what he's asking is, what did you leave out of Hey that <laughs> maybe team members really wanted to be in there, but you, you just didn't? Oh, my didn't God. Even... So many things. I, here's the thing about a 1.0, version 1.0 of anything, is not all your ideas. It's not the best version. It's not everything you've ever wanted to do. It's simply what made the cut. And there are so many things that didn't make the cut that we'll add in subsequent releases. We've already added some. We'll be adding more and more down the road. We're currently working on Hay for Work, which will allow companies to use Hay and all the employees to use Hay together um, and, and host your, your company's email on that. So we're working on that right now. Um, there are so many things. Um, one of the features that didn't make it that I really liked was simply a feature called waiting on. Sometimes you send an email to somebody and you're waiting on a reply from them. And so we had this feature, we built the feature early on where you'd, you'd mark something waiting on and it would put it into a separate pile. So you can keep track of the things that you really know you need to hear back from someone about. So you can see, you can go to that, that list later and go, oh yeah, these are the six things that I really need to get answers back from. And then the system could potentially send out a nag or something to the other person saying, hey, Jason really needs to hear about this or whatever. Um, as we started using it, we didn't build the whole feature. We just built basically the way to flag something is waiting on. And it didn't have enough bite. There wasn't enough value in it without kind of completing the whole idea, which is like the, the additional system going out and, and helping you out by reminding the other person that you need something by a certain time. So since we didn't build the whole thing, we decided to hold it back so we didn't build sort of a half-ass piece of software. So we held that back. There's a lot of things like that um, that, we, that we held back that weren't fully formed. But the idea is right, and it's there. And we'll get to it later when we can complete the whole thing and put the whole thing out. Um, but there's a number of little things like that. But waiting on is one of those, like, the first thing that comes to mind is something I still want today. But we didn't really make it useful enough to put it out there. And I'd rather kind of make a splash with it when it's actually really fully ready. But there's literally hundreds of things we didn't do um, that we're yeah. going to do. And 2021 specifically is going to be pretty exciting for Hey, We've got a lot of things planned this week. Pretty fun. Awesome. Did I read somewhere, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was posted in a tiny seed Slack by just a, a founder who was commenting that, did you guys release numbers, either like MRR that you launched to or number of customers or number of users? Was it like 100,000 users a month already or something? Yeah. So when, when, when Hey first launched, we signed up about 200,000 people in the first few weeks. Wow. So the, the interest was off the charts. We, didn't, we, we, we knew we had something really good here. Yeah. Um, we didn't know that it was really going to strike a nerve like it did and it, how it's continued to strike a nerve. Um, so we're really excited about that. We had about 200,000 in the first couple of weeks. A lot of this was driven by the Apple News and the publicity we got there. But a lot of it was driven by pure excitement over the product as well. Like people were so hungry, finally. To, to do something new with email and see email in a new light. And like when they, when they watch my demo, I give this 37 minute demo, which you can find on, on YouTube or if you Google like Jason Freed, Hey Demo or Hey Walkthrough, you'll find it. Um, when people watched that, I think it got a lot of people really excited um, about 
the product because I shared the philosophy behind the features and then walked people through the features at the same time. And I think a lot of product people really appreciated like, that type of work walkthrough. Um, and that got people fired up and people signed up about it and told about it and told everyone. And we had an invite process and the whole thing. So there's a lot of that. It's, of course, tapered off, as, as you'd expect. I mean, it's like, boom, launch, tapered off. Um, but, you know, we have tens of thousands of paying customers um, already. Um, conversion rate's been, been pr pretty wonderful. We're pretty happy with that. Um, it's been more than base, higher than Basecamp, which has been great. Um, and there's some things that a lot of people really, really want. Like, for example, custom domains, which has been was something that a lot of people have been asking for, which we don't offer yet. Everyone gets an at hey.com email address. Once we launch custom domains later this year, I think a lot more people are going to jump back in and check it out again for a second time. So we're very comfortable with, with how things are going and, and it feels really great. All right, awesome. Congratulations on that. Um, Thank you. So Deep asks, he says, I love your contrarian way of thinking. How do you suggest a new founder who wants to build a company with solid values and a solid culture that sticks. I think he's asking just that like Basecamp has such strong culture and values and you've obviously been deliberate about that. Like how can, how can another founder do that in their company? First off, um, it's a mindset, right? So you have to believe that, that that's what you want. So don't follow us. You can't follow us or follow anyone because that's not, you're not being true to yourself. If, we, if you believe what we believe, then you're being true to yourself. But don't, don't look to us and go, I want to be like them. Figure out what matters to you. Um, and it's all about actions. So, for example, like, it's not about what you write down. It's not about you know, your, your handbook. It's really about the way I like to think about culture. Is it's a 50-day moving average. Hmm. What have you been doing as a company over the last 50 days? How do you treat people? What, what do you do when people are stressed out? How, how do you help people? What kind of cr criticism or critique do you give? What kind of feedback do you give? How do you share? How do you help people who are stuck? Like those are the things that make the culture and those things can change, which is good and bad. But what, how have the last 50 days been? That's kind of how I look at it. Because there's always these spikes or these moments. For example, we launched, hey, two weeks of incredible stress, terrible stress. I, I hated it. Um, it was wonderful, but I hated it. Uh, but it's unsustainable. And so we're past that now. So now we're settling back into how we want to be because um, we don't want to be working late at night and working on the weekends and being stressed out. So I think it's a matter of, of how you act. It's a matter of the last 50 days or so of how you act and understanding what's important to you. Now, real quick about this. Um, a lot of people like look at our, our benefits and they look at our handbook and they read that and go, I want to be like that. It took us 20 years to get to that. I mean, we didn't offer... Most of these, I mean, we've been layering in things that we've been learning. We've been layering in benefits. We've been layering in the ability to give people more vacation time or to give people more sabbatical time. Like we couldn't afford to do some of these things many, many years ago. And I, for people who are just starting out, a lot of people in your audience, this is probably, the beginning is probably not the right time to be extremely generous on time off. And, and you know, like wait till you have some, 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 some cushion, some room in the bank and you can layer things in as you go. So figure out what the most important things are. And in my opinion, the most important thing to begin with is free, which is make sure you give people more time to themselves during the day. Longer stretches of uninterrupted time to get their work done. That is the best benefit any company can give any employee. Um, and, and let them go home at the end of the day, uh, fulfilled, satisfied, get a good night's sleep, come back, refresh the next morning. That's a wonderful benefit and that doesn't cost you anything. Bravo, sir. All right, so a question from Justin Jackson whom you know, he says, as, hey, hate, <laughs> as hate takes over the world. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. I was reading the wrong question. You joked saying building hay was the dumbest thing we've done. On a serious note, do you regret it at all? All the drama with Apple, the scale of the app, et cetera. I don't regret any of it. Um, I, I'm thrilled that we built hay. Hay's going to make base camp better. Hay's going to make hay better. Base camp's going to make hay better. I like this thing where we can go back and forth now. One of the things we've learned about launching something new is that you launch something new and, you, and that's the only time you can really explore really new ideas. And those new ideas, you know, of course, affect the, the new product you're building, but they also affect the other things that you have. So we're, we've already begun work on Basecamp 4, which is going to be out next year. And a lot of those ideas came from the things we developed when we built Hay. So Hay is going to benefit everything. Um, I don't regret the, the Apple uh, fight at all. I, I think it was absolutely the right thing to do and we're, we're continuing to do so. Um, we're supporting a whole wide variety of um, 
of, of efforts and initiatives to, 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 you know, bring this to, to the government's, you know, awareness and, and you know, both in, in the, in the U S and the EU, um, standing with other companies that are fighting and, and other developers that are fighting, because this is not something you just do and, and walk away from. Like Apple's going to be relentless about this and you've got to continue to stand up for, for what you believe to be right. So no, I don't regret it. I, that said, it was a horrible, it was the most stressful time we've ever had in 20 years. Those two weeks were, were mm-hmm. terrible. Um, again, like exciting and hugely rewarding, but terrible mentally, physically. We aged, we aged, we didn't feel good. People were sick. It wasn't, it wasn't a good time. Um, so, um, what I would regret is if we stayed at that pace past the first couple weeks of launch, that would have been, a, that would not be worth, that would not have been worth it. But the fact that we've been able to, to kind of settle back into our normal cadence we hired like five customer service people um, really quickly. That really helped a lot to bring the, we were getting about 2000 emails a day um, when we launched Hey. So like it, we just weren't ready for any of those things. So that was a mess, but we, we, we remedied that and now we're comfortable again. But if we were not comfortable and had to live at that pace, I would have regretted it, yes. Yep. All right. This is an interesting question. I actually get this one now and again and I sometimes struggle to answer it. So I'm, uh, I'm curious how you take it. So. The question is from Tom Biscan, and he says, if you didn't have your brand and your resources, how would you start a company today? Would addressing something as big as email be possible without that kind of leverage? Um, it's a great question. I would launch the company the same way we launched Basecamp when we had no branding and no awareness, which is slowly, carefully, with no ex- expectations. Um, we were a web design firm when we, la- when we started. We launched this base camp thing. We built it for ourselves. We did it on the side. We put it out there and we waited a while to see if it was going to work. It turns out it worked really well. And then we were able to stop doing the other thing that we were doing. Um, so I, so, so there, like I would do the same thing. I, I would always try to have, I, I wouldn't, I don't like putting myself at risk. I like taking a risk, but I don't like putting myself at risk. So um, in the case of when we launched base camp, no one really knew who we were. We had a little bit of a following, but like, you know, a thousand people reading our blog. It was not very big compared to today. A lot of people have a lot larger followings today when they launched than we did when we launched. Um, it's much harder to reach people back then. Everything, but we had a, we had a functional business of some sort that was going that could fund our endeavors into something else. And only when that something else did better than the other thing that we stopped doing the other thing and start focusing a hundred percent on Basecamp. So I would do it the same way and keep your cost again cost low, small team, no rent one or two or three people to start struggle through that um, before you, you make it hard on yourself by it's, it seems like you'd make it easier on yourself by raising money or hiring more people, but you're actually in some ways making it a lot harder on yourself. So I'd start as, as small as you can and, and, um, and, and, uh, and keep that, you know, maybe a little bit of money here and there. Right. But not a big amount of money, which forces all sorts of unreasonable expectations on you. As far as tackling email, um, no, we couldn't. We could not have. Other people might be able to. We could not have tackled email in the way that we chose to do it. Um, had we not had um, probably a big brand behind us to launch, um, it was. It took us two years to build Hay, and the expertise that we needed, we didn't. We would not have had had we just started today. It took us twenty years to understand how to do this, how to deal with the loads we were gonna we were gonna have, how to deal with the technology that we needed to build. Um, all the infrastructure, email is incredibly complicated. It would not be the first thing I would ever choose to pick off. Um, yep. So we could not have done it. Um, but that wasn't about the brand necessarily, although it helped to launch, but it was more about the understanding and the learning and the, just the skills and experience that we needed to build over the last 20 years to be able to feel confident enough to even take this challenge on. Yep, excellent. So I think we have time for one or maybe two more questions. Uh, and we have several pouring in. So some really good, I'm, I'm picking the best off the top. This is a really interesting one, and it's actually one that I've thought about, and I was going to ask you on my own, so, so I like it. It's from Tim Van de Castile, and he says, you, meaning Basecamp, decided for a while to only have one product because you, you, know, you used to have several products, as you said. Uh, yeah, I won't name them, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. It was higher campfire, and we all, ta-da, list and all this stuff. You actually decided for a while to only have one product, stopping actively developing the other products and selling them off. What made you to decide that you still wanted, or you wanted to go back to being a multi-product company? So this is sort of an interesting one, and I'll, I'll try to make it fairly brief because I know we don't have a lot of time. We didn't set out to build another product, actually. 
when we built Hay. We set out to build a new version of High Rise. So we set out to build High Rise 2, like we built Basecamp 2, and now we're in Basecamp 3 and we're building Basecamp 4. But we we're going to go back and build High Rise 2. As we were building High Rise 2, we recognized that um, there was something else going on here that we were building, that we wanted this thing that we were making for all of our communication, not just business communication, but personal, family, all these things. And so eventually it splintered off into its own thing. But I think we, what we learned about well, what's good about having two things versus one thing is, again, that you get to start from scratch again more frequently. Um, so we're building, you know, we just built Hay. Now we're doing Hay for work. Next year we're going to do Basecamp 4. We're going to learn some stuff. We're going to pull some stuff from Hay into Basecamp 4. When we build Basecamp 4, we'll learn some new things that we'll bring into Hay. So I think this idea, what we're calling it, is like TikTok development, back and forth, back and forth between two products is actually a really fresh and, and healthy thing to do. I think, though, it wouldn't work for us if we had three or four or five. So I think two is what we feel right now is probably going to be our sweet spot. It's going to be different for every company. If you have hundreds of employees, you can do more things. We have 56, 57, 58 employees. At our size, at our scale, we feel like two is right. And here's one other reason why we think two is right. Basecamp's product cycle, so we do basically do a new version of Basecamp every four to five years. Whole new version from scratch, essentially. And the, when we launch that new version, we're all in on it. But then over the next number of years, we're basically just making marginal improvements around the edges. That's te te like technically what happens to mature products. You're not like reinventing the product every year. Like you just kind of can't reinvent it every year. So what ends up happening is you built up this, all these skills and all these people who are really wonderful at making products. And then we're putting all those skills and just making marginal improvements around the edges. And it's not a really efficient way to run a company, actually, with all that talent just tweaking which is what ends up happening with mature products. So by jumping into a new thing, we get to use all that energy and all that talent on something brand new from scratch, work on that for a while, and then jump back on the other thing and make a whole new version of that. And so we're going to be making new versions of things more frequently in a staggered way, I think, which is going to just be a healthier perspective for us. So that's, that's I mean, in a nutshell, that's why we decided to do it. It kind of was an accident. Then we kind of leaned into it. And now we think it's kind of probably going to be the right thing to do. Awesome. I'm yeah. glad to hear it. Well, yeah. Sir, if you, we're over time, but do you have quest, time for one more question? Of course, yeah, because I've gone long on these answers. No, no, this is great. This is perfect. Um, there's a, I, I like this question. Uh, so it's from Johnny Tong, and he says, how does Basecamp manage employee career progression when it favors a low headcount slash flat structure? Because, you know, a lot of people want to progress and move up the chain, and in a larger org, right, that, that's easier to do. So I, I'd love to hear your take on that. Yeah, it's a really wonderful question. Um, and we've struggled with this over the years. Um, what we basically do is we don't really have a managerial track. So people in most companies, people move up, right? Um, at Basecamp, you, you move sideways by expanding your, your ability. So for example, a lot of our designers get better by learning programming as well. So they're not just designers, but they, they do all their CSS themselves. They do all the visual design. They do a lot of rails. Now they do a lot of JavaScript now. So, so they sort of expand outward. And that's typically how most people progress. And then they move up in the organization on our pay scale because they have more skills and they take more responsibility. We do have team leads. So there are some team leads, but they're pretty well established. People who've been here for a long time. So it's not a very, it's not like a, a high churn position. So those positions pretty much sit there. Um, but, but people sort of expand their skill set and then move up in our pay tier. So that's something that's, that's kind of unusual actually at companies because most people actually they get narrower and narrower in a sense. They, they move into a managerial track where they actually lose a lot of the skills that they had and, and they atrophy like me. I've, I've atrophied. Like I, I'm, I'm not as good anymore as getting in the HTML and CSS like I used to. Like I, I'm not just not that good at that anymore because I've been focusing on other things. And this happens to a lot of people as they move up through management. But at Basecamp, well, we want people to get better at their craft. And so, you know, if you could think of a, someone who's, who's good with woodworking, loves woodworking, they might also expand into other materials. They might explore, you know, uh, metal. They might explore ceramics. They might explore other things. They're still using the same skills, but in, in different mediums. And I think that's the idea here at Basecamp is that you might be a great designer, but you might want to pick up some programming or you might want to be a better writer. And that's how people expand. And that's how people get paid more and move up the scale uh, at our company. And then there are some people, always some people who just simply do want to run teams or manage people. 
And if there's not a position here, it's totally fair for them to say, you know, Basecamp doesn't have what, 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 what I want. Um, and I'm going to move on to go find a place that does that. And we would gladly help them. We'd hate to lose them, but we understand that like, it's no, it's not good for us to keep anyone who would want to do something else. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to help them find something somewhere else that would satisfy that. We've had a number of people who either left to manage bigger teams or left to start their own businesses. Um, and, uh, that's great. We're, we're, you know, happy for them and, and want to support them as well. Sure. And I bet they're set up well to do it because with Basecamp on your resume, you can get hired by most of the people that I know. So yeah, Jason Freed, yeah, it's helpful. Such a, such a gentleman. Thank you for taking your time to, you know, to give back to founders. Um, I've been, I mean, this is the kind of stuff where if I say it one-on-one, -on -one, it sounds awkward, but like I've been an admirer of yours for at least 14 years. I've read all your books and, and I just love, I love having conversations with you because you're, you're always just dropping knowledge and giving back to founders. So thanks so much for, you know, sharing the stage with me again. Well, thanks, Rob. This was great. And I'm happy to, by the way, answer additional questions that people have them. Um, you can email me at jason at hey.com, H-E-Y, or on Twitter, Jason Freed, F-R-I-E-D. Um, and I'll try to uh, answer there as well. Awesome. Thanks again, Jason. Catch you next Thank time. Thank you.